national security challenges and U.S. military activities in Europe. Uh, we are joined uh, by two witnesses, Dr. Celeste Wallander, who is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs for the Department of Defense, and General Ted Walters, who is uh, the U.S. Air Force Commander for the Europe U.S. European Command. Welcome both of you. Before we get started with that, um, tomorrow will be the last day of work on this committee for Paul Archangeli, who I think most of you know, who is our, our staff director, has been our staff director for 12 years, I think, now, and has been on, on the committee for 18. Um, and I really want to thank Paul for his service um, to this committee. As we most of us know, he's also a, a veteran of the U.S. Army, did, did bomb disposal in the Army uh, before coming to work for the government. Um, and we are all going to miss him terribly, me more so than anybody else. Um, he has done a fantastic job for this committee, but mostly I'm, I'm very happy for him. Um, it's it's a good move. It's been it's been an ever so slightly stressful job for the last few years. Um, so it's it's a terrific move. Also, Paul's recently married, um, so big, big time for him. Um, and very happy for where he's at it. But I just, I can't say enough about the job that he's done for this committee. Um, we, <laughs> yes, we. <laughs> We, we are constantly told in this committee about how we, we pass our bill every year uh, going on, I think, 61, 62, 61, something like that. Um, and certainly there are a lot of people who contribute to that process, um, but nobody more so in the last, you know, 10 years than Paul. He, he understands, you know, what this committee is all about, the fact that we work in a bipartisan manner, the fact that we are here to serve the people who serve our country. We do our job so that they can do theirs better, and he knows how to bring people together. Um, and I think that's, that's the thing that I've been most impressed about by the way Paul approaches his job, is he knows it is about people and about relationships. Um, he cares deeply and personally about everybody involved in this process, makes us feel included, and makes us all better at what we do. He has helped build a culture here that enables us to do our job better. Um, and personally, I'm sure I could have done this job without him. Um, I don't think I could have done it well. Um, when I first got this job, I, I was in a little bit over my head, uh, but Paul was not, and he took the time and the patience to sort of guide me and educate me about that, and also to be a good personal friend, to understand that it's not just about the job, it's about what's going on in everybody's lives, and you have to understand that if you're going to get the best out of people and be most supportive of them. I could go on at great length, but Paul means a lot to me. Um, he, he will be missed, but again, I want to emphasize um, this is not a sad day. We are, we are very happy for him. He has served this country well. Um, he is going to go on to other things in his life and do those every little bit as well, I am sure. And mostly, I just want to thank him for everything he's done uh, for this committee, for this Congress, and this country. So thank you, Paul. We appreciate your service, and good luck. It is uh, an incredibly important hearing that we have this morning, as you all know. Um, there's always a lot going on in the world uh, that is of concern to this committee and of concern to the U United States defense policy, but Europe is the central focus right now because of Russia's brutal, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and all the implications that flow from that. Um, so really look forward to, our test to the testimony from our witnesses today um, about the situation there. There's a number of different aspects to it. Certainly, we want to get the latest, the update on what's happening in Ukraine. Um, I think that the president and others have stated our policy clearly. We need to protect Ukraine. Um, well, basically, there's three key pieces to it. We need to do everything we possibly can to support Ukraine in their fight against Russian aggression. We need to make sure that we don't stumble into a wider war with potentially catastrophic consequences for the entire globe. We do not want a war with Russia, and we have to be cautious about how we approach this to make sure that we don't do that. And lastly, we want to make sure that this is a strategic failure for Putin. A number of people are, you know, pop, you know, asking the question, how does this end? I think the honest question is nobody really knows. Um, but how it should end is with Russia basically going back where they came from and Ukraine being the sovereign democracy that it is and was and should always be. 
That's how it should end. Now, that's easier said than done, but I think that goal as our overall policy should be the, the central focus. So we want to know what's going on in Ukraine. We want to specifically know what we can do to be supportive. The Ukrainians have, have fought incredibly bravely and, and better than I think just about anybody expected. We have to give them the help they need to continue that process. And then, of course, there are broader implications beyond Ukraine. Um, you know, what, what is our policy in Europe? Uh, what are we going to do to shore up defenses in Eastern Europe? Without question, NATO is more important now than it has been for a very, very long time, and in particular in Eastern Europe. Um, I met yesterday with uh, Romanian members of the Senate. They are very concerned. They want our support. As you know, Poland, the Baltics, all of the countries in Eastern Europe and throughout Europe are concerned. We need to have an adequate posture in Europe to deter Russia from any further aggression. We want to hear how you're going to put together the plans for that. Well, at the same time, I want to, want to thank um, both of our witnesses today for the leadership that has brought NATO together uh, to a greater extent than it has been in a long time. Um, I think the whole world was surprised the degree to which our alliance joined together and in unity responded uh, to this Russian invasion through our support for Ukraine, our support for economic sanctions. I think we have learned beyond any shadow of a doubt that alliances matter, okay? That America first isn't going to get you very far if you don't have friends and allies and people who can work with you in the world to meet the challenges that we face. I want to know how we're going to build upon that going forward. And then lastly, budget was released. Um, two days ago now, I think. Um, how does that affect what you're trying to do? What, what are the keys? What, what is the most important thing that you need to be able to provide that adequate deterrence in Europe? Not the most important thing, but what is the package that is going to be necessary to give us the support necessary? What's most important in the budget? How are we going to make that work? Um, this is an incredibly important theater and a very timely uh, moment to have this hearing, so I look forward to our witnesses' testimony and the questions and answers from members. And with that, I yield to the ranking member, uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I concur with your observations, and I also concur with your celebration of our staff director, and I would note that he has Alabama roots, which makes him even cooler uh, and will be missed. Uh, but I want to thank our witnesses, uh, uh, express uh, my appreciation for your service to our country and your preparation uh, for this hearing. Uh, we're a month into Putin's uh, catastrophic invasion of Ukraine. The, offensive, uh, the Russian offensive appears to be stalled. If Russian casualties don't exceed 10,000, they soon will. The Ukrainians are starting to retake ground. The time to double down is now. But I'm concerned that's not going to happen. Time and time again, this administration has been petrified of Putin, too afraid that common sense actions to support our partners and allies may be deemed escalatory. As a result, uh, they were way too slow to get aid to Ukraine. We should have started back in Thanksgiving with visible, aggressive deliveries of lethal aid to Ukraine. Instead, the White House wasted months. The first presidential drawdown package didn't start flowing to Ukraine until January of this year. But there weren't any stingers. U.S. stingers didn't make it to Ukraine until a week after the invasion. Poland's MiG-29 offer was embraced by the State Department, only to be rejected by the White House. Slovakia is willing to provide S-300s to Ukraine but the Defense Department can't find suitable backfill. It's been going on for two weeks. And there are still no coastal defense cruise missiles, even though Maripol is being flattened from the sea. And these are just a few examples. There are a dozen more. Dithering needs to end. We need to flip the script and make Putin afraid of escalating against the West. Here's what I'd like to hear from our witnesses today. I'd like to hear that our policy in Ukraine is to win. That means giving the Ukrainians the resources to drive out every last Russian on Ukrainian soil. I'd like to hear that we've identified a backfill for the Slovak S-300 and it's on its way to Bratislava as we speak. I'd like to hear that we have a plan to get coastal defense cruise missiles to Ukraine. I'd like to hear that we're ramping up production of Stingers and Javelin command launch units. We also need to dramatically ramp up production of small tactical UAS systems like Switchblade and get more of these systems into Ukrainian hands. Finally, I'd like to hear that we're going to reinforce our allies with permanent bases in Poland, Romania, and the Baltics. I've been pressing for more dispersed forces in Europe for years. We owe it to our allies and our partners, especially those on the Eastern Front. Nothing less than our full forceful support will do. 
Finally, General, I know that your time at UCOM is supposed to come to an end in the next couple of months. It's my hope that Secretary Austin uh, sees fit to extend your time a little bit and so that you can help see us through this crisis. I don't want to make your wife mad, but we need you. <laughs> so uh, I really think that having a transition at UCOM right now is not in the best interest uh, of our country. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wallander. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Rogers, and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on policy matters related to the U.S. European Command area of responsibility in my capacity as Assistant Secretary of State of Defense for International Security Affairs. Before I begin, I would like to express my appreciation for the continued support from Congress and this committee in shaping and resourcing the Department of Defense's efforts in this region. It is an honor to appear alongside General Walters, who is an outstanding partner. This time last year, the focus of this hearing was strategic competition and how that was shaping our world. But today, what we see is no longer a mere theory of strategic competition. Instead, we see Russia engaging in an unconscionable and illegal use of force against Ukraine in the most violent act of aggression in Europe since World War II. The United States condemns Russia's unprovoked attack against Ukraine in the strongest possible terms and deplores the tragic loss of life, enormous human suffering, and indiscriminate destruction caused by Russia's actions. Russia's full-scale invasion threatens not only Ukraine, but also poses the gravest threat to Euro-Atlantic security in decades. We must continuously assess our posture in Europe to address the evolving strategic landscape while maintaining the critical role of our alliance in securing shared interests and values in the region and avoiding escalation with a nuclear power. The department has three priorities regarding Russia's invasion of Ukraine. First, we aim to bolster Ukraine's ability to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity, for which Congress's assistance is vital. Second, we seek to maintain unity with our NATO allies and our partners. Finally, we will continue to deter any Russian aggression against and defend every inch of allied territory. To those ends, we will continue to provide defensive security assistance to help the Ukrainian people as they defend their country. With thanks to Congress, the United States has committed more than $4 billion in security assistance to Ukraine since 2014, with more than $2 billion since August 2021 alone. I am proud to say that with the leading role from the United States, the global response to Russia's aggression has been remarkable. With unprecedented sanctions and a wide range of global humanitarian and security assistance flowing to Ukraine. There have been notable reversals of long-held restrictions to provide lethal assistance to Ukraine and meet NATO's benchmark of 2% defense spending, as in the case of Germany. Simply put, Russia's attempts to divide the United States from its allies and partners have failed miserably. After Russia's invasion of Crimea in 2014, the United States, with the support of Congress, embarked on substantial changes to our posture in Europe. This involved infrastructure improvements, building partner capacity, increased rotational presence, more exercises and training with allies, and enhanced pre-positioned equipment and stocks. We also focused on expanding our access, basing, and overflight permissions in Europe and increased security assistance funding, especially on NATO's eastern flank. All of these moves have come into play during this crisis, validating our investments and preparations. In the last two months, we have swiftly repositioned forces already in Europe, extended specific rotational forces in theater, and deployed significant additional capabilities. These adjustments included placing the entire U.S. commitment to the NATO response force on heightened readiness, repositioning forces to multiple eastern flank allies, extending or bolstering maritime forces already in the UCOM AOR, and deploying additional air, ground, space, and cyberspace capabilities. With these recent deployments and, ex and extensions, the United States now has approximately 100,000 military personnel either stationed in or deployed to Europe and its waters. We are also working with allies to ensure that NATO is prepared for modern challenges and able to deter aggression from any adversary. 
Allies have deployed defensive land and air forces in the eastern flank and maritime assets across the NATO area. For the first time in history, NATO has activated its defense plans and deployed the NATO response force in a deterrence and defense role. The People's Republic of China, the PRC, is also active in the UCOM AOR, and we know that the PRC and Russia collaborate across a variety of arenas, including joint military exercises. This is an element of strategic competition that the United States is monitoring closely. This work is only possible with consistent congressional backing and stable funding. Congressional support for the U.S. forces deployed in the UCOM AOR, as well as funding for defense initiatives across Europe and security assistance for Ukraine, have been and will continue to be critical to achieving U.S. national security objectives. Russia's actions have brought to light the stark contrast between our democratic values and our rules-based international system that the United States leads and Russia's autocratic, violent vision. The Department of Defense, in conjunction with other U.S. government departments and agencies, NATO allies and partners, and in close consultation with Congress, will continue to work for a secure and stable Europe. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I appreciate your continued support to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and civilians in the Department of Defense who work every day in the service of the American people. Thank you. General Walters. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Rogers, distinguished members of the committee, and Paul, on behalf of the men, women, and families who serve our nation, we extend our thanks for your steadfast support. It remains a privilege to serve alongside these dedicated patriots and all of our allies and partners. It's also an honor to testify with Assistant Secretary of Defense Celeste Wallander. She's a tremendous force multiplier for our entire team. And appearing with us is our UCOM Command Chief, Phil Easton. He's a force of nature at her headquarters in Stuttgart, Germany, and he leads from the front with respect to treating people with dignity and respect. We're fully aligned with the Department of Defense priorities to defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork. Every day we work to generate peace with our allies and partners by strengthening the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic. This is a pivotal moment in Europe with generational implications. When testifying before this committee last year, Russia was already on the path to further intimidate and threaten Ukraine while testing the will and resolve of the transatlantic alliance. Russia's premeditated and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has galvanized our allies, and global partners. We admire the courage and tenacity of the Ukrainian armed forces and citizens, and we so respect their sovereign democracy. In the Euro-Atlantic area, NATO remains the cornerstone of deterrence and defense. As we face the largest conflict in Europe in three generations, our transatlantic alliance has responded in all warfighting domains. In the air, NATO has established an air defense architecture along the eastern flank that includes contributions from 11 separate allies. On land, allies continue to deploy additional forces to enhance its forward presence from Tallinn in the north to Sofia in the south. At sea, our standing maritime forces are infused with additional capabilities to ensure freedom of navigation spanning from the Arctic to the south to the Aegean. Aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean dramatically increase the inherent air combat capability in NATO's air defense architecture along the entire eastern flank. NATO's capabilities in space and cyberspace are more closely integrated than at any other time in the Alliance's history. The sum of these modern multi-domain capabilities underwrites the security of NATO's Article 5 guarantee. A protagonist of our commitment to NATO begins with our efforts in the United States European Command. Our primary mission is to compete, deter, and prepare to respond to aggression with the full weight of the NATO alliance. Our investments in military-to-military -military relationships, training, and readiness build unity, resolve, and combat credible deterrence. U.S. UCOM, with support from forces in the continental United States, has sparked the Allies to enhance posture along the eastern flank. Rapidly deploying three brigades of European base and CONUS base combat forces, a carrier strike group, 
and fourth and fifth generation fighters. This effort is America's effort with soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, guardians, and Defense Department civilians from all 50 states and territories, some based in Europe, others rotating into Europe from across the nation. This build is enabled by years of focused investment through the European Reassurance and Deterrence Initiatives, as this committee well knows, commonly referred to as ERI and EDI. These enhancements, including facilities, prepositioned equipment, rotational deployments, and all domain exercises, has improved our speed and agility. As a brief example, thanks to EDI and ERI, we were able to deploy the entirety of an armored brigade combat team from Georgia in the United States to Germany in just one week. That level of speed is unmatched globally. On behalf of the men and women of the European Command, we thank Congress and the American people for their contributions in this effort. The capabilities the Department has brought to bear in response to this acute security environment have required critical partnerships with U.S. Transcom, U.S. Cybercom, U.S. Stratcom, and the intelligence community. These partners are vital to establishing and sustaining our current deterrence and defense posture. We are witnessing a generational moment, a historic demonstration of unity and will, and an unprecedented effort by allies to strengthen defense while simultaneously helping those in need. Just an example, but it's a very critical one. We've seen Germany commit to meet the Alliance 2% benchmark, and we expect other allies will follow and redouble efforts to adequately invest in defense to generate peace. From Turkey in the southeast to Norway, Sweden, and Finland in the north, in air, land, sea, space, and cyber, our allies and partners are committing. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Rogers, thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Uh, Gen General Walters, I think one of the central questions is the issue that the ranking member raised about what, what we can provide for Ukraine. Um, and, you know, I think part of it is that balance between giving Ukraine the help and not spreading to a wider war. And certainly before the war began, the issue of what we should give to Ukraine was informed by that deterrence versus provocation. And I would say that a concern about giving Russia an excuse in provoking them is the reason some of those weapons weren't provided. It's the same reason that President Trump did not provide those weapons either, um, as we were trying to walk our way through that. But now that the war has begun, um, how do you balance that risk? I mean, do we take Mr. Rogers' approach and basically say, we don't care what, what Putin does? You know, we should, I don't know, send troops and tanks and whatever we can in and basically fight in Ukraine? Or what, what is the proper way, you think, to strike that balance? And, and what are you concerned, or are you concerned, about how Russia might respond to, to a given action? And would they spread the war to Poland, to the Baltics, conceivably even to U.S. assets in the region? How do you balance that risk? Chairman, as a military commander, my first answer is constantly. Uh, the conditions change second by second, day by day, week by week. And I bear the responsibility, number one, to ensure that we don't forget as military commanders that nations have the inherent right to gift whatever they would prefer from a multi-domain, excuse me, from a, from a unilateral, bilateral, multilateral perspective. Secondly, I have to take into account military mission effectiveness coupled with strategic miscalculation. And one day is different than the next, and so depending just, upon the conditions, sorry. we have to adjust. So, do you think there? Did you? What, how would you specify the, the risk of Russia escalating, and and how do you think about that? Is is yeah, I know it's something you think about. What's the risk there, and what might we do that could provoke it? What would it look like? It depends, and, and the risk that we have to gauge is the risk that Russia first imposes upon Ukraine. So we, we have to be smart about imaging our way through Ukraine's military perspective and then taking into account what the allies and partners can contribute. And we're always concerned about the force protection disposition of the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian citizens and obviously the populations on the periphery. But, but all of that has to come into our cross-check. 
but outside of Ukraine is what I'm trying to get at. Is is there a, I mean, is there a risk that if we, you know, get more engaged that Russia would spread the war? And if so, how would they spread the war and to where? There's always a risk, and, and they, they obviously are capable of utilizing all domains and, and their whole of government capabilities. So as a military mission planner, I've got to take into account all of those branches and sequels. And, and obviously, as a NATO commander, I am most concerned uh, about the eastern periphery of Europe as it connects to Russia. Okay. So, but we can, in fact, provide a lot of weapons to Ukraine uh, with, within that manageable risk, and I think we are doing that. What's most important to your mind in terms of what weapons we need to get into Ukraine right now uh, to help them? And I agree with Mr. Rogers. The goal here is to push the Russians out and win, and win the fight. Um, what are the most important weapons the Ukrainians need right now to make that happen? I can go deeper in a classified uh, session, Understood. Chairman, but but what I can say is uh, th those capabilities that are anti-armor, anti-tank, and surface-to-air missiles are very, very important. They have been effective in the campaign, and I suspect in the near future they will continue to be effective. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to correct the record in uh, saying that President Zelensky <clears throat> has never asked for American troops to come and fight on Ukrainian soil, nor have I. We want them to get everything they ask for that they need to win this war, and that's, that's my position. Um, the DOD comptroller announced yesterday, and I was surprised to hear, that there were zero changes made to the president's budget uh, based on the Ukrainian invasion. Is that accurate, Dr. Wallander? Uh, Congressman, I am... I have not seen that reference. I apologize. I can't validate whether that is true. I can take that question back uh, to get you a solid I just can't answer. imagine we wouldn't be adjusting the budget to reflect what's happening in Eastern Europe right now. Yep. Uh, you heard me say in my opening remarks that uh, Slovakia has offered S-300s, which are desperately needed by Ukraine, but all they've asked for is us to backfill. Why is it taking two weeks for us to not get them something? It, tell me there's the cavalry's on the way. Um, yes, Congressman. Um, we are working with uh, Slovakia to identify the requirements for meeting their needs. Um, I, I, I can speak, and General Walters can speak in greater detail during the classified session, but we are working on this. And meanwhile, we have focused on uh, getting countries that hold Soviet legacy systems, including S-300 systems, uh, that have sp spare parts, missiles, different, different parts of that S-300 system who are willing to send that to Ukraine. So we have not simply been waiting for a resolution of that offer, but have been working on getting the Ukrainians what they need right now. And when is that going to be? That is ongoing, and we can talk in greater detail in the classified session. Okay. Well, I would urge that you uh, continue to keep this committee updated on your, your progress, at least on a weekly basis. Uh, General Walters, you and I have talked many times uh, over the last couple of years about the need for the redistribution of our troops uh, in, in the European command uh, and with ha to establish permanent basing in uh, Poland, Romania, and in the Baltics. Uh, what is your best military advice as to whether or not permanent U.S. forces in Poland, Romania, and the Balts will help reassure NATO and deter Russia? Congressman, it's got to change. And, and certainly this is an opportunity as a result of, of this senseless act on behalf of Russia to reexamine the, the permanent military architecture that exists not only in Eastern Europe, uh, but, but in, our, in our air policing activity and aviation and in our standing naval maritime groups. And as you well know, we're in the process of establishing eight very coherent minimum battalion-sized battle groups in Eastern Europe that have all the appropriate enablers uh, that are coupled in with all the air policing assets and all the standing naval maritime groups so that we can more comprehensively defend in the east and do so in the north all the way back to the Atlantic Ocean, extending back into the Mediterranean. And, and in so doing, uh, the NATO nations that are committing that I alluded to in my opening comments they're going to be part of the equation, and they're very willing to do so to change the presence from a, a, a rotational to a more permanent, and I think it will continue to grow, and we're working very hard with the North Atlantic Council to do just that. Well, and I think that's a an important point. You know, I, I talked earlier about uh, 
the Ukrainians not asking us to, to put troops there. They haven't asked us to give them anything. They're willing to pay for the stuff they're asking for. They just want us to get it to them. And, uh, and in Poland, uh, the Polish government's offered to pay for us to establish a permanent base there. Everybody wants a base, but that's the first time I've ever heard of a country willing to pay for it. So I, I do hope that we see that happen. The rotational troop presence is not adequate. It needs to be permanent. And I think that going back to the chairman's opening statements, the best way that we can solidify and enhance our relationship with our NATO allies is to have that permanent basing there to show that we are committed to this relationship. Um, Lastly, on the switchblade, uh, that's one system uh, that I've examined, and it seems uh, to be something that would be effective. Uh, Dr. Wallander, are, are you familiar with that system? Um, yes, Congressman, and um, we have, like you, been focused on its capabilities and received the message loud and clear from our Ukrainian colleagues that this is required. We have um, um, committed uh, uh, 100 switchblade tactical unmanned aerial systems to be delivered in the most recent package of presidential drawdown. Sure. So we've taken that, we've heard the Ukrainians and we take that very seriously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And of course, we should all remember we also passed a $13.4 billion supplemental out of Congress signed by the President specifically to, to deal with Ukraine. Um, Mr. Lynchman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. Um, uh, let me begin well, with uh, with both of you. I have a question on cyber uh, related. The Russian Federation obviously has continued to leverage cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns against uh, uh, Ukraine, Europe, and and the United States. Though we have not yet seen the level of cyber activity that we had anticipated from Russia, we still have to be ready for it. How are you preparing your cyber defenses for the potential cyber attacks uh, from the Russian Federation? And, uh, and I also want to know how you're helping us to bolster the cyber defenses of uh, our European partners and NATO to the degree that we can talk about this so in open session. Congressman, uh, first and foremost, we went to the basics with respect to cyber employment. And as you well know, a, a great cyber offense starts with a great cyber defense. So I, I know that General Nakasoni and team we're very, very aggressive with respect to assisting the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian Department of Defense to improve their network hygiene and network defense. And those efforts started in the November, December timeframe. And the same considerations were given to those European nations on the periphery. And we can talk in more detail in a separate session, but that good defense has been very, very helpful. And I think it reveals in some of the challenges that Russia has faced with respect to their cyber offense against the Ukraine and against the European nations on the periphery. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Wallander, uh, our national defense uh, strategy calls uh, for us to utilize the concept of integrated deterrence. Uh, I believe certainly cyber is a critical part of our deterrence capabilities in coordination with other uh, deterrence methods. Uh, in this uh, unclassified uh, setting to the degree which you can, how are, uh, are we working further with, uh, with NATO to utilize? to utilize our, our cyber, cyber capabilities, particularly within the context of the, uh, the European Deterrence Initiative. Um, Congressman, thank you for your question, because integrated deterrence uh, does include um, the cyber domain. Um, and the United States has worked closely with allies to improve their resilience, um, to monitor um, networks, uh, to share information. Uh, and that work is ongoing, because the um, challenge of a Russian activity in the cyber domain is persistent. Um, the, that element of the deterrence is not only about capabilities in the NATO context, it is about the multinational nature of the alliance and the commitment to defend one another and combine together the efforts of NATO allies in the cyber domain, send a very strong, credible um, message to Russia um, that helps to reinforce that deterrent message. Thank you. Yeah, incredibly important to leverage those capabilities wherever possible in working with our partners and allies uh, to strengthen those uh, capabilities. Um, Dr. Wallander, uh, first of all, I, I want to uh, commend uh, both President Biden and the Biden administration, uh, the Department of Defense, and our European partners and allies for uh, supporting Ukraine and really stepping up to the challenge in this historic crisis is caused by the Russian Federation. Uh, and I agree with uh, the chairman's comments that uh, we need to make sure that uh, Russia is, is pushed back and that Ukraine stays uh, free and independent. Um, in, in your view, 
uh, are there any further ways that Congress can help provide better support to Ukraine? I know we've talked about this already, but uh, in a you know, further uh, ability to elaborate on any thoughts you may have, and have there been any barriers that we can uh, 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 um, uh, overcome to help you get through? And uh, what about when it comes to humanitarian assistance as well? Thank you for that question, Congressman. And I want to reiterate our gratitude for um, not only the scale of the assistance that the Congress has support provided in um, budget support, um, but the speed with which Congress um, took this as a priority so that we're able uh, to support Ukraine. This fight is, because of the courage and the capability of the Ukrainian military forces and citizens, this fight is going to extend. Um, and so looking forward, uh, first of all, we do have, in addition to the option of presidential drawdown, we have the Ukrainian Security Assistance Initiative, and we're looking at what that next set of package um, should contain with an eye towards not just days and weeks, but months of sustainment, perhaps longer for the Ukrainian um, military and Ukrainian people. Uh, I would you know, defer to Department of Treasury and Commerce, but clearly uh, the Ukrainian government, in addition to security assistance, needs humanitarian assistance and economic ass assistance now that it's clear that this fight is going to continue for some time into the future. So we look forward to working with you on um, a broad multi uh, multi-agency support for Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Wilson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank both of you for being here today. Uh, what, what a time in history, and uh, many of us never anticipated a land war uh, in Europe uh, ever again, uh, but that's where we are, and to face it. And uh, Putin did one thing uh, totally unintentional. He has unified Republicans and Democrats. Uh, you will see that uh, together uh, we uh, agree with President Biden uh, that we're in a long-term conflict between autocracy, uh, which is ruled by gun, or democracy ruled by law. And so uh, we, we need to be together, and that's why I'm really grateful that uh, working together with um, myself, with uh, Congressman Marcy Kaptur, uh, the issue that has come up is the delay in providing the equipment to the people of Ukraine, how brave they are uh, standing up uh, to uh, the Russian military. Uh, and uh, as Congresswoman Captain pointed out uh, yesterday, uh, there, are, there is body armor awaiting in a, uh, a uh, storage area in Chicago uh, for the U.S. Department of Commerce to approve delivery. That, that's absurd. Uh, we, we need both of you uh, with positions you have uh, to uh, act quickly. And then uh, particularly I'm grateful, um, uh, Secretary Wallander, that you've been the president of the U.S.-Russia Foundation. So you have such a knowledge of Russia. And um, along with that, uh, as uh, uh, Ranking Member um, Mike Rogers indicated, uh, we should have months ago uh, been providing the uh, military equipment uh, to the people of Ukraine. Uh, in fact, uh, I appreciate that Mark Levin has uh, uh, revealed that uh, in August, uh, in the Kremlin website, uh, there was an essay uh, by Vladimir Putin that uh, really, in the tradition of Mein Kampf, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, he says the historical unity of Russians and uh, Ukrainians. That's not what he means. What he means, the unity means no existence of the country of Ukraine. And so ho hopefully, uh, particularly General you, I, I hope the intelligence is provided as to how we can best protect the people of Ukraine. And with that in mind, for uh, each of you, what are the weaknesses that you see uh, in uh, Russian military and or uh, their diplomatic efforts? What can we do to exploit those weaknesses? Uh, hey, um, try to bring to the people of Russia uh, that they are being betrayed by Putin, uh, the young people of their country. He is um, just putting uh, at, uh, at, mer at uh, risk of um, uh, imminent death uh, only for oil, money, power, uh, Madam Secretary. Well, on the, um, on the political military front and the weaknesses, um, the Russian narrative, and you yourself have you know, pointed to uh, how absurd 
and non-plausible the Russian claims uh, as a pretext for the invasion of Ukraine are to the international community. So um, the work of the United States closely with allies and partners to expose what the Russians were preparing to do, the pretexts in which, and the, and the absolutely without foundation pretext has galvanized the international community more rapidly uh, than any really expected in contrast to the, um, well, the experience in 2014 when they invaded Crimea. So I think that has been a key element of the weakness in a political military sense I, um, that has enabled us to pull together the unity on sanctions, on assistance to Ukraine, and on diplomatic isolation of the Russian leadership. Thank you. And General Congressman Wilson, I think it goes back to the point you just made at the beginning. In, in, as a military commander, I want to do everything I can to, to, to strengthen our support uh, to Ukraine armed forces based off where they are in, in the midst of their campaign. And from a whole of government perspective with respect to what nations do to include the U.S., everything that we're doing in the information environment needs to continue and it needs to strengthen. And I, uh, uh, Secretary, indeed, uh, it's so impressive to see NATO unified, 21 countries, uh, as the co-chair of the EU caucus, to, to see 27 countries, unprecedented, uh, of the European Union providing military assistance. Uh, and then uh, we need your uh, influence too. Uh, there are two countries that should be doing more. Uh, Israel, uh, which in, in a destabilized world, they've already had three attacks in the last week, murderous attacks. Uh, another country, India, the world's largest democracy. Uh, instability in the world uh, will lead uh, to ca catastrophe uh, for the uh, terrific people of India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, and uh, their wonderful government needs to understand that they need to be standing with democracies, uh, standing with Ukraine. I yield back. time has expired. Uh, Mr. Larson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Wallander, um, I want to pull back a little bit. Um, it's going to be a lot of Ukraine questions. This is more of a NATO uh, policy question. Uh, NATO is looking to launch uh, something called Diana, um, which is their tech accelerator. and. Um, uh, I just wanted to get your view on the department's uh, view of the Defense Innovation Accelerator of the North Atlantic. It's a NATO project, kind of it's a mashup, if you will, like our DARPA and DIU and, and a few other things. Um, can you can you just quickly update us where the department is on that? Uh, Congressman, I don't have details on where the status of that project is. Here, I can get I you know would get back to you with details. But what I but I, what I do know is that. As um, NATO allies have recognized not just the scale of the threat that Russia uh, poses to European security, but the multi-domain challenges that both Russia and China pose to global security and certainly also to NATO, the willingness to cooperate more in the area of technology going forward has deepened and has strengthened, and this project is an opportunity to advance that. All right, thanks. I just wanted to <clears throat> make sure it's on the record and not, not lose this opportunity um, to ask that. Uh, General, General Walters, I want to follow up on something uh, <clears throat> Representative Wilson brought up, uh, and it's kind of just show how, how international affairs is local affairs in Washington State. We have uh, about 100,000 Ukrainian, Ukrainian Americans. Uh, my district is like 16th out of 435 in terms of number of Ukrainian, Ukrainian Americans in the country. Um, it's always a surprise for people, people to hear that. And uh, so we asked them, asked the community some questions about what they wanted to ask. And this gets to Representative Wilson's question about aid and personal protective equipment and the ability to, to deliver that uh, to the civilian population in Ukraine. Can you, be, can you give us some detail on how that is happening? Congressman, we at USUCOM have, have two centers uh, with approximately 100 individuals that continue to iterate uh, in the military dimension with Ukrainian liaison officers that are working both the security assistance items in the military dimension and the humanitarian assistance items. And, and it's an iterative process, and it's based off supply and demand and extends with feelers into Ukraine at the ministerial level and at the CHOD level to, to make sure the, the right stuff goes in at the right time to deliver the appropriate effect in the campaign based off access to get in and access to get out. It's, it's not perfect by any means, but it continues to improve over time. And we'll continue to iterate and make sure that we continue to connect with those interlocutors at the Ukrainian level to ensure that they get the right gear 
as quickly as we possibly can. Is there an issue with moving it into into Poland or into Romania now, if you will, and then and then so so it's there instead of in the U.S. Sir, it's by with and through Poland, and it's by with and through Romania. Uh, I can talk a little bit more in a classified okay. setting, but but there are challenges. But at the end of the day, we always uh, communicate with the host nation to make sure that right. we're, we're we're doing the right thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, and and to go uh, even even more local, but it's obviously a national issue. Uh, the Growler mission is located in NAS Woodby Island, and there's news uh, yesterday, a couple days ago, that uh, we're sending a national mission squadron to Germany. And I presume there's a CVN squadron already on the Truman and the Aegean Sea as well. And this might be a uh, classified <laughs> um, answer to a question, but can you give us some idea about uh, um, either, either mission maybe starting with the mission, the national mission into, into Germany? Sure, I can elaborate more in a separate setting, but what I can say is uh, you're right, they're coming. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I look forward to that. Uh, what do I do with my last minute, Mr. Chairman? Um, I'll, I'll, yield. <laughs> I'll yield it back, thank you. That's fine, I'll yield. Um, at a programming note, I know some uh, question, uh, classified stuff has come up. So the plan is we're going to be here until 12.30, 12.45-ish, and then we'll start our classified brief at 1. Um, give you a brief, brief break in there. Um, Mr. Turner is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, um, I appreciate your statements about Ukraine, and specifically you said, you know, we want to strengthen our support for Ukraine. And I, I, I know that... Um, your efforts to do so are incredibly important. I want to talk to you about the sharing of intelligence. There was a great deal of concern initially when the conflict began um, that the United States had actionable intelligence, intelligence that could assist the Ukrainians in having the ability to defend their country, and that there was delays in getting that intelligence to Ukraine. Um, are you uh, are you comfortable now with the speed at which our ability is to, uh, to, to share that information? Uh, with Ukraine, and do you, do you think that, um, as looking to strengthening our support for Ukraine, are there are there gaps or areas that we need to address? Congressman, I'm comfortable, but I want it to speed up, and I always will say that even if it occurs in one second, I want it tomorrow to be in a half a second. And as you well know, uh, the, the DNI's participation and the and the NSA's participation at the very start of this campaign were revolutionary. And as as Sakir. What, what I needed most to do was get that data to the nations to get the knack to be convinced soonest to make the appropriate moves based off the disposition in the periphery of Ukraine. Uh, as good or bad, it's better than I've ever seen, and we achieved consensus from a NATO body quicker than we ever have in the past, and it was a result of the intelligence sharing, but it needs to continue to get faster. John, that's a great point. I, I know everyone's always frustrated with the, the speed of sharing because, and, and also, you know, you, there has to be some assessment as whether or not the intelligence is important uh, and, and whose hands it need to get into. And of course, dealing with Ukraine, you're dealing with an area where there's a conflict. General, are there, are there restrictions on geography in Ukraine? As we look to Ukraine and, you know, the Donbass region, areas of conflict, and trying to help Ukraine, are, are you are you are you seeing instances where we're tying our own hands, where where there are limitations geographically within their own country, where the United States is unwilling to share information with Ukraine about what Russia is doing is in its own country? Sure, I haven't seen that. It's just access to, to some of the the far eastern cities, and as you well know, that's a challenge for humanitarian assistance as well as intelligence sharing. And as we image our way through this campaign and we provide our best military advice to our Ukraine counterparts, we, we continue to make them aware of this very issue and they are iterating in an attempt to improve. And what do you mean by access to the Far East cities? Just the tyranny of time and distance uh, over land going from Eastern Europe to the Mariupol region. But, but you're, you're, you're ability to generate intelligence isn't, isn't limited by, by space. It is not, but just getting that data I into the right got it. receptor. Got it, got it. Dr. Wallander, I, I want to thank you for your, uh, uh, on page 12 of your um, <clears throat> report that you included the issue of the Balkans and referenced the date and peace accords. I do think that that is an area where we've continued to have vulnerabilities that we've kind of ignored. Uh, the issue of Republic of Serbska, uh, the ability for Russia to destabilize the area 
uh, I think needs our, our increased attention, and I, I appreciate that you continue in your uh, European focus to, to look at that as, as an issue. I have a question with you, uh, for you, though, about Ukraine. We, we do hear that um, of the number of refugees uh, and the individuals who've been displaced in Ukraine, <laughs> the number of refugees who've left Ukraine, but we're also hearing reports of individuals being taken against their will from Russia, from, uh, excuse me, from Ukraine to Russia. But we're not hearing much from the, the White House about that. What can you confirm for us about individuals being taken from Ukraine against their will to Russia? Um, Congressman, I, um, I've seen the reports that uh, you refer to as well, and they are very concerning. Um, I don't have anything, uh, that, uh, any independent information that I can f confirm here, but we, c I can get back to you on uh, what Great. we I are would, able would to really do. Great. I really appreciate that. that General, we had good news of the, the Germany the returning to the F-35, where they had initially indicated they were not going to uh, be part of the F-35 family. Finland has agreed to, to become part of the F-35, and now Canada has made its announcement. Um, great effects of, of Russia's um, aggressiveness. Uh, tell us strategically how you think that the, um, the number of nations that are now committing to the F-35 will affect um, the strategic capabilities of NATO and our partners as, we, as they face Russia. They'll deliver an events, a, 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 a tremendous improvement in, in our strategic ability uh, in indications and warnings, command and control, and mission command, as already demonstrated by US F 35s that are contributing uh, in the Assure and Deter mission at this time. And we anticipate, and Congressman. I, I do apologize, Jim, Jim's time has expired. Um, Mr. Courtney is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to both witnesses uh, this morning and to General Walters. Uh, Again, I went and reread your bio. I mean, you have been showing amazing um, leadership, not just since the invasion of Ukraine, but going back to when you took uh, the helm in, in 2019. Uh, I, again, for a lot of us in this committee, we remember in 2020 that there were efforts to cut U.S. troop levels in Germany um, and uh, eliminate the rotation of Marines up in, in Norway, and your steadfast um, you know, I think adherence to duty in terms of the value of NATO has been certainly validated uh, over the last uh, months or so. And, and again, I just want to publicly thank you for your, your great service. Um, you mentioned in your uh, remarks about how the U.S. recognizes our allies' um, you know, great collaboration, but also that their own sovereign ability to gift um, resources. Uh, last Saturday, um, the Ukrainian foreign minister publicly stated that, um, you know, based on his conversations with um, officials in Washington and in Poland, he, he stated that uh, the U.S. has no objections to the transfer of aircrafts, uh, MiGs, uh, from Poland uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and he went on to say, as far as we can conclude, the ball is now on the Polish side. Um, again, this was Saturday, so this was just a couple days ago. And I, again, there's a lot of high interest, certainly back home in my district with a large Ukrainian population. Can you just clarify for me, just or, and for I think a lot of us, you know, what is the, the state of play in terms of you know, the decision maker to, to get that, I think, critical um, platform uh, to, to the Ukrainian Air Force? Well, sir, at the, at the national level, I, I would suspect it's, uh, it's the prime minister or the president that ultimately makes that decision, g given the potential for strategic miscalculation. And, and that's what I've seen in practice so far. And in a different setting, I, I can get into some of the uh, more tactical level details that weigh into the decision. But again, it goes back to the, 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 the military mission effectiveness weighed against strategic miscalculation to, to make sure you take into account the the protection of the citizens of Ukraine as well as the citizens on the periphery. So all, all those variables have to come into play. But you just described accurately where I believe the situation currently sits, and nations still continue to look at this issue, and they will still continue to examine it, and we'll still provide our best military advice, and we'll do so based off conditions in the environment at the time. Well, thank you. I think, again, your answer was very edifying in terms of getting um, clarity on, on that. And again, I think the Ukrainian pilots have done just magnificent work. And if there's ways that we can uh, get them more um, jets, I think that would certainly be um, much, you know, beneficial, be very beneficial. Um, 
you know, we've, we've heard, uh, again, some of the back and forth regarding the speed with which material is getting into Ukraine. Uh, Dr. Wallander, you and I spoke offline a little bit about um, uh, a sometimes overlooked combatant command, which is TRANSCOM. And I just wonder if you could just kind of give a general sense of just the speed and um, efficiency with which General Van Ovos and her team is uh, proceeding to get material into, into the, you know, NATO and, and ultimately to U Ukraine. Um, yes, Congressman. I mean, it is pretty extraordinary, especially since um, the U.S. has been able to focus on the option of presidential drawdown um, to be able to pull um, the kinds of uh, capabilities that the Ukrainians have been prioritizing from U.S. stocks. And then through UCOM, I'll credit to General Walters and his team working with Transcom, uh, in some cases to move from the moment of approval to actual delivery of those capabilities within days and certainly you know within weeks. Um, so it's been an extraordinary uh, effort by the U.S. military, and it's made a difference on the battlefield for Ukrainian forces fighting Russia. As General Omar Bradley once said, strategy is for amateurs, logistics is for professionals. And I think Transcom has really risen to the task and shown that they are true professionals. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Lamborn has recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Doc, uh, Secretary Wallander, I have a question for you to first. And this, these questions are based on the limited information we've been given out so far on the nuclear posture review. We've seen three paragraphs. We haven't seen the full review. But even with that, there are some serious concerns that I have uh, based on that language. It seems that the declaratory uh, policy of the use of nuclear weapons has been narrowed, uh, that it will be only to deter nuclear attack, and there's no mention of deterring non-nuclear strategic attack or to achieve any other U.S. objectives. And to me, the, lim the more limit that we have on our range of action that gives more freedom of action to potential adversaries. So is that a limitation in, in for sure? And if so, did you have any conversations with allies or partners about this narrowing of our policy? Um, Congressman, thank you. For, uh, to your second question first, um, the, the U.S. has consulted with allies and um, on the nuclear posture review, previewing some of its uh, outcomes. And my understanding, I wasn't in those consultations personally myself, but the reports I have is that allies were very satisfied uh, and did not have concerns about the, the content of the nuclear posture review, the language. Um, the nuclear posture review language um, does not apply exclusively to nuclear attack, but extends to um, extreme circumstances that would require the United States to uh, defend allies and partners. I'm misquoting the precise language, but there is an a, a, absolutely a provision uh, that is continuity with um, previous uh, posture review statements. Okay, well on that, we can continue our conversation after we see the full review. That, that would be very helpful when that comes out. Uh, General Walters, I have a question for you based also on the limited information we have on the NPR. Uh, Admiral Richard has said that the nuclear-armed sea-launched cruise missile is intended to deny potential adversaries any mistaken confidence that limited nuclear employment would provide an advantage over the United States, its allies, and partners. So if we're going to limit the or uh, do away with the future of funding for the Slickum in uh, to me, that goes against what Admiral Richard has said about it. Do you agree with what Admiral Richard said about the utility of the Slickham N? I do, Congressman, and I know his words were, were attempting to drive home the fact that having multiple options uh, exacerbates the challenge for the potential enemies against us. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so it would be your best military advice that we continue the development of that particular option. It would, and I agree with Admiral Richard. Okay, thank you. And a follow-up question, General Walters. Um, the proposed budget of the Biden administration would retire the B-83 gravity bomb. Uh, as you recall, a decision was made a few years ago uh, to keep it in, f in effect until other capabilities would supplement that capability. Were you asked for your best military advice about retaining the B-83 capability? 
Congressman, I, I was not on that particular issue. I'm only familiar with it as a result of what's coming next, and I know that Admiral Richards is making sure that th th there's no gap. But, but that's, as, that's as far as I can go with that one. So can you comment on your best military advice about using the B-83 currently to deter aggression in your AOR? Again, it's, it's, I would concur with the utilization of that to complicate the challenges of the enemy against us uh, as long as there's not another system that is in place. And, and I know that's part of the issue with the transition. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all I have for now, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lambard. Mr. Garamendi is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Garamendi is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We might add to that question that you just raised, Mr. Lamborn, what is the cost of keeping all of this? And what are the options that may have a higher priority? But that's not my question. Uh, we often hear here the word multi-domain. Multi uh, one of the uh, things we occasionally hear is that information is a powerful weapon. And the question arises about information for the Russian people about what is actually happening in Ukraine. So my question to both of you is, what is the status of our information efforts to enlighten the Russian people about what their leader is doing to their brothers and sisters in Ukraine? So let's start with Ms. Walters. Um, thank you, Congressman. Yes, information uh, in the hands of the Russian uh, government has been um, a weapon. Um, it's been a weapon that they've been less successful in deploying to the effect they seek, and that is precisely because, as you point to, the U.S. allies in the global community uh, have, them, have ourselves uh, utilized information, which in our case is true information, facts, not disinformation, to set the records straight. And the impact, I'll just say the impact of that information is made clear by the efforts that the Russian government makes to try to prevent that information getting to the Russian people. And they're not completely successful, but it is an ongoing struggle to get that information. Completely missed my point. What is the Department of Defense doing, and larger, what is the U.S. government doing to bring information to the Russian people? That is, to get information past the censorship that Putin has employed in his country. So specifically, what are you doing? So we can talk about uh, in greater detail in the session this afternoon. We would defer to that uh, setting. General Walters, is the answer the same from you at this hearing? Sir, I can elaborate uh, more in a closed session, but what I can say is in, in the military dimension here at USUCOM, we, we, we have a large program that targets that very issue. Uh, in Ukraine and, and, and with the nations on the periphery. Well, I then will await the classified hearing. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitman is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. General Walters, I want to expound upon the point that's been made about the timeliness of getting these munitions and supplies to the Ukrainians. And we know that this is particularly important as we are working to get those thousands of Stinger missiles and javelins to the forces there. Uh, there is, I think, sometimes a lack of clarity about how that's being accomplished and what the, what the urgency is with that. But I wanted to get your assessment on the demand signal from, the, from Ukraine. Where is that? Is it being met? Is the demand signal going to get greater? And what about from our European allies that are helping send uh, weapons there and what we're going to do to help backfill some of that? We had an earlier question in those areas. And have you evaluated the potential, potential operational availability of things like man pads in Ukraine? And look at all the different aspects that are there about what we can do to help Ukraine in many different ways. I, I argue that 
the tide is potentially starting to turn at what the Ukrainians are able to do to the Russians. The Russians right now are limited in their maneuver, in, in their maneuver which is a, a big advantage for the Ukrainians. The problem is, is that we're at one of those tipping points that if we really don't go all in to help them, then they won't have a chance to defeat the Russians. I think, I think defeat, defeating the Russians, which wasn't on the table, I would say, 35 days ago, is on the table now. So give me your perspective on the demand signal and the backfill for our allies and what we have going forward. Well, Congressman, we, we actually want to connect the dots uh, for the demand signal and the input. Yeah. And, and with the input process, there are human beings that are involved in that input process and protecting uh, their livelihood is, is very important. So the, the mode of delivery, the diversification of those modes of delivery, and obviously the, the end game is getting the right stuff to the right soldier at the right time. Mm -hmm. And all those variables have to come into the equation. And I will tell you that with each passing day, uh, we iterate with this with greater thinking, uh, great, greater alliance involvement, and greater connected tissue with, with our, our counterparts inside of Ukraine. And that process has to continue, and it has to be looked at every second of the day because as the campaign changes over time, what, what's, what's good for yesterday might not be what's good for tomorrow. So all that has been taken into account. Congressman, it's not perfect. And I, I hope when you get a chance to come visit us that, that you'll be able to visit some of the troops that are involved in this process, and they're, they're targeting this very issue. Fantastic, General Walters. I look, look forward to, the, to that visit. Uh, Dr. Wallander, Stingers are a tremendously capable weapons platform. The challenge is they are a circa 1960s weapons platform. We're using them at an extraordinary rate. So the question then becomes, what are we doing going forward to replenish our short-range air defense systems. Those short-range tactical weapons, incredibly important. But we're gonna have a big hole in our inventory. So the question is, is uh, what can we do to replenish those stockpiles? Is it smart to replenish them with a circa 1960s weapon? Are we doing anything in the long term for short-range air defense systems? So give us your perspective on what we're going to do with that because that does, while helping Ukraine today, does create a challenge for us in the months and years to come. Yes, Congressman, you've absolutely identified a challenge that we've, um, we've, we're grappling with the Department of Defense and also many of our allies and partners who've generously made contributions to Ukraine are asking questions also about replenishing their stock. Um, the Undersecretary for ANS uh, Acquisition and Sustainment is leading uh, an effort in the department to look at the defense industrial base, to look at our authorities, and to look at funding in order to address exactly this challenge. It's just beginning, but I think you'll begin to hear about this because it is something we have to address. Very good. I mentioned stingers. That's one part of it, but there are a lot of different moving parts, as General Walters talked about, in things that are going into theater, parts that are moving around. Give me your perspective on where the future challenges are, not just with Stingers, but other parts of our inventory. And then are there lessons that we are learning about logistics in this whole effort to be able to supply our, our, our friends in Ukraine and help our allies in Europe uh, get resupplied? Uh, as General Eisenhower once said, he said, tactics are for amateurs, logistics are for professionals. And we want to make sure we understand the, the logistics chain on this. Well, from a, I'll just speak narrowly from a policy um, perspective is um, we do, we are doing an assessment of the needs because we're hearing from individual allies and partners about their concerns. And we want to bring a comprehensive assessment to Congress and work with you exactly on uh, thinking forward and not just running after the problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Uh, Ms. Spear is now recognized for five minutes. Okay, I think uh, we'll come back to Ms. Spear. Uh, Mr. Norcross is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate it. And uh, fascinating discussion, uh, certainly from our industrial base and the idea of the stingers, what we are using from our strategic reserves, what other NATO countries are supplying. Uh, but incredibly important that uh, we understand that for every stinger that is leaving our inventory, it keeps us in a more precarious situation. Because as we know, the line is not hot now and what it's going to take 
certainly agree with Mr. Whitman is, do we want to recreate the old ones or move into new ones? And that's a discussion we're looking forward to. But General Walters, I wanted to talk to you about the evasion. Uh, I think by virtually all estimates uh, that Russia is not doing anywhere near what we expected them to do in Ukraine. Uh, when we look at that, did Russia overestimate their ability? Uh, did we look at their capabilities thinking they would do better? Or is it the Ukrainian response? If you could give some clarity on there, have we Overestimated what Russia has outside of their nuclear stockpile, their conventional forces. Congressman, I think we we have fair agreement in the hardware, software, and human capacity. I, I think what we what we have to take into account is the fact that it's a little bit of both. Uh, the the will and determination of the Ukrainian citizens. There's 44 million Ukrainians, and it every single one of them is contributing. And then you just take a look at the capability of, of the Russian military, and there's certainly challenge. And as we all know, we all have plans. And when the invasion starts, what you thought was going to happen typically doesn't happen, and you have to go to alternate COAs. And that's a test of the flexibility at the strategic level all the way down to the tactical level of the military. And I contend that Russia has been challenged in that area, and that reflects in their overall performance. So have we overestimated the and I'm outside of the Ukrainian resistance and what they're doing in the fight. Have we it, overestimated their technical abilities, particularly with their uh, the Russian armor? We may have, Congressman, and I think once we get to the post-conflict phase, we, we need to go back to these very areas and, and make sure that we conduct a, a, a comprehensive all-domain after-action review and find out where our miscalculations were in our forecast. Well, rather, absolutely, I, I have to agree with that, that what implications that will mean for our force structure and, and what we're working on, uh, certainly in the European theater. But uh, thank you for uh, that insight, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. Uh, Mr. Scott is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Doctor and General. Thank you for uh, being here. I know we've had a, a lot of discussion about the Ukraine lately. I think the world owes uh, President Zelensky in Ukraine a great thank you. I fall into the category of uh, Vladimir Putin had no intentions of stopping uh, with the Ukraine. Uh, the Russians have been across the border in both Georgia and Moldova for a number of years. Uh, Georgia and Moldova have recently uh, officially applied to the European Union for admission. Uh, could the two of you speak to that particular issue and what that means for European security and if you expect Russia to be more aggressive towards those countries because of that application? Thank you, Congressman, for um, highlighting that while well, even we're fo as we're focused on Ukraine, there are other countries in the Euro-Atlantic space that are vulnerable to Russian coercion and influence. Um, Moldova and Georgia have long suffered uh, unresolved conflicts that Russia uses to uh, keep uh, its own corrupt influence in, inside those countries and to, prevent, or to try to prevent um, their Euro-Atlantic aspirations, but as you note, it hasn't. Um, the people of those countries do continue to hold those aspirations and their leaderships continue to work on democracy, rule of law, anti-corruption, um, and the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine just highlights the importance of sustaining those, the United States sustaining those efforts along with our European allies and partners. I, I, th I think it's just important to note that uh, assuming Ukraine, the Ukrainians win and are able to force the Russians out, Russia is still across the border in, in other countries, and uh, we, we need to restore those territorial, the integrity of those territorial boundaries as well before uh, the world believes that this, this Russian aggression is over. Uh, I do think, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, uh, I, I do think that we as the United States and NATO needs to be developing a Black Sea strategy uh, because of the importance of the trade that comes out of that region for the world. And uh, I, don't, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but the, 
the raw materials for fertilizer, the amount of wheat and grain that comes out of that part of the world, uh, it's very concerning to me that, that a transit is shut down. And while the Montrose Agreement guarantees freedom of passage for uh, civilian or commercial vessels during uh, peacetime, uh, my understanding is that is it, that is shut down now. Is that correct? That, that civilian vessels and commercial vessels, because of the uh, conflict, are not transiting in and out, whether it be because of insurance costs or, or other reasons? Uh, Congressman, to, to your first point, I, I couldn't agree more about comprehensive defense uh, w with respect to all of the regions in Europe and, and what we do in the Black Sea and what we do in the Baltics and what we do in the North Sea, we, we can't just get myopically focused on today with what's taking place with Ukraine and Russia. We have to image our way through the next five or 10 years, and we're doing that. With respect to the Black Sea, there is still small travel back and forth with small commercial vessels for the appropriate reasons, but, but Turkey is the owner of the Montreux Declaration, and, and I would just characterize what they're doing in, in, this, in this arena as, as is very, very picky with, with who goes through. And they're doing that for justifiable purposes to make sure that they too can uh, protect against strategic miscalculations. But we need to get back in the Black Sea and it needs to occur sooner rather than later. Well, countries like Georgia can't export or import uh, without, without access to, to the Black Sea. And I just, I, I think we need to be, uh, paying attention to, to the other countries as well as um, Ukraine. One thing I would mention to you, the um, and I think that what has happened in Europe has kind of reinforced this with the committee. Uh, every year, the DOD, I'll, I'll pick on the Air Force on this one, comes to us with a list of weapons that they want to stand down. Uh, they have, for the last 10 years, come to us and said, we want to stand down a certain number of A-10s. Uh, it has long... Um, been, I believe, the belief of the majority of the committee that before we stand down a weapon system, that weapon system should be offered to countries that share our uh, interests and our values. Uh, do, General, do you think that the DOD will, will take a, a stronger look at, at sharing those weapon systems with others who share our interests and our values instead of simply standing them down as, as we push forward? I think they will, Congressman. Thank, thank you both. Thank, thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Ms. Spears is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, too, want to add my congratulations um, to Paul for his extraordinary service to this committee. It's been a pleasure to work with him. Um, to our two uh, presenters today, thank you for joining us. Uh, part of the conversation today has, um, I think, underscored uh, the fact that we are united, both on the Republican and Democratic side. Um, but there appears to be this interest in wanting to keep poking at um, the president. And I just want to say once again that the former president wanted to remove 20,000 troops from Germany and was talking about America first as our um, whole policy. What we recognize now that it's um, a united front and that NATO's relationship is critical and that we've seen them come together. Uh, General Walters, you um, referenced yesterday that there probably was a gap in our intelligence gathering uh, relative to Russia's uh, prowess. Um, do you have any more that you can share with us about that? When I think about the fact that they only spend $69 billion on their military, we spend $740 billion. Um, it seems like we should have recognized that uh, they're, they're not up to the task when it comes to training and maintaining their uh, weapon systems. Congresswoman Speer, I, th there could be a gap, and I think what we owe our citizens is once we get into a post-conflict environment is to go back and examine that very issue to, to make sure if there is, in fact, a gap, we rectify it. But, but at this point, I, I agree with you that, that there was a degree of miscalculation, and, and it's evidenced by the performance of the Russian military up to this point, and I think we need to be prepared to take a, a, a really good look at it. Do you think that the, um, the light airstrikes that they have actually undertaken has um, something to do with the fact that they're probably not maintaining their fleet? 
I, I think they're not maintaining their fleet of aircraft to the same level of expertise or excellence that we do in the United States. Dr. Wallander, um, we met with Ukrainian members of parliament yesterday. Not only are they, is Russia taking uh, busloads of uh, people hostage to Russia, they've taken evidently 2,000 children who have been orphaned as a result of this war that they engaged in. What are we doing to amplify that internationally, to call them um, into question and to recognize the parallels to what was going on in uh, World War II? Um, Congresswoman, we've seen these reports as well, and they are um, both shocking and, and, um, and very concerning. The, my understanding is the State Department is tracking reports of um, these, these kinds of atrocities and uh, violation, potential violations of international law um, and is working with allies and partners globally to track those and to press Russia to cease in the activities and to lay the groundwork for holding Russia accountable in order to, to reverse what Russia is doing but also make sure that the world doesn't forget. Well, I hope that we um, declassify information that we have in this regard. We have to amplify the, uh, the gross actions by Russia. Dr. Wallander, um, we've seen evidence of Russia using the so-called vacuum bomb in Ukraine, which is indiscriminately targets nearby civilians by literally sucking the air out of their lungs. Uh, I'm concerned uh, that we draw attention to that, that um, you are able to confirm if in fact they're using that. I presume that those would be um, you know, crossing the line and akin to the use of chemical and biological and tactical nuclear weapons. Um, can you comment on that? We clearly see a change in Russian tactics towards more aggressively targeting civilian infrastructure, civilian human life, uh, and indiscriminate use of uh, weapons, artillery, missiles, and the, I believe you're referring to the TOS-1A. Yes. But are we ampli I think we have a responsibility to amplify what we know they're doing that is so heinous. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Speer. Mr. Desjardins is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Walters, uh, I'm becoming increasingly concerned about what appears to be intel community failures over the past year. Uh, we were told that uh, Afghanistan nationals would hold for at least six months, and we were told that Ukraine would probably fall in only a few days. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we gamed a scenario. The intel community did a great job in predicting the invasion, the amount of troops, the number of tanks. Uh, but here we are on day 34 or 35, and, and I don't think it was gamed beyond, you know, the, the initial two to three days. In Congress, we, we rely on these assessments uh, to, to allocate resources and weapon systems. How concerned are you about what appears to be intel failures, and what do we do to correct those moving forward with looming threats such as China, Taiwan? Congressman, just to be fair, and I know you know this as a commander, that the, the, the world of a 21st century intel officer is very difficult. I often ask our intel professionals, what is so-and-so thinking? And as we all know, a threat is defined as capability and intent, and part of that intent is what one human being is thinking. And, and given the structure of, of how Russia operates, it's very difficult to determine where, where President Putin's head was the entire time. But I, I think what we owe each other is once we get the facts about how this unfolded and what was said and what was accomplished, we, we need to go back and take a look at our soft areas and, and make sure we fix those. And I, I agree with you. We, we've had some tremendous work conducted by the intelligence community. Th th this one has been baffling as a result of Russia's challenges and, and the spirit of, of the Ukrainian citizens and their contributions were probably areas that, that we need to examine one more time to make sure that we're aware of, of their contributions to the outcome of a campaign. Yeah, and, and I'm grateful uh, the way NATO has stepped up and, and in many ways led after this conflict uh, transpired. You know, just three, four years ago, President Trump was accused of trying to destroy NATO by asking them to meet their uh, GDP assessments. And it seemed to be pretty prophetic, and now in the face of uh, the current conflict and threat, 
uh, these countries are stepping up. Uh, you mentioned Germany. It's, it's good to see them do that after essentially free riding the U.S. security gar guarantees for more than a decade and cozying up to Russia economically. How do we prevent a backslide uh, in the event that this turns out the way we want, and how do we keep our NATO allies on board? Uh, better communication from senior military leaders like myself to, to the North Atlantic Council to go back over and over again and describe to them what their contributions when it comes to hardware and software and people uh, are, are doing with respect to our ability to better defend our NATO turf. And the more we do it, the more we maintain the positive campaign momentum in this area and the more we figure out how all this contributes to keeping the citizens more safe. Uh, it will keep the countries interested. And, and their level of involvement will continue to increase. Okay. Uh, I've been disappointed in the President's almost schizophrenic messaging before and during this conflict. Uh, initially, sanctions were the deterrence, and now we've learned that sanctions were never meant to deter. Uh, he, he had mentioned here recently that we would respond in kind to a chemical weapons attack, and that uh, you know the mention of sending MiGs has been brought up several times today. Uh, but it, it uh, apparently was uh, too provocative, but apparently bringing up a regime change was not too provocative. So how is this mis messaging uh, from the President and the White House affecting your ability to uh, conduct operations on the ground, and what effect is it having on relationship with our allies? Uh, Congressman, I'll just tell you that the, the alliance unity in NATO is as powerful as I've ever seen it. And, and my suspicion is uh, that trend is going to continue. So in that arena, no effect. Okay. And I, I'd had one more thing that maybe we can talk about in the classified setting, but I'm pleased to hear of your support for the uh, Sea Launch cruise missile. And, and uh, I, I guess I would just ask, if Russia did decide to use nuclear weapons, is it your assessment that they would most likely use the low yield variety? And uh, what, what uh, are the limits of fallout and damage from that? I'd prefer to address that in a, in a separate venue, but, but what I can tell you is, as a military commander, I, I have to be prepared for Russia to exercise all options, and that's just one of them. Okay. I'll look forward to further discussion. Thank you both. Thank you. Mr. Gallego is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Wallander, thank you for your testimony. I was glad to see you highlighted the Baltic Security Initiative in your written remarks. As you know, this initiative provides targeted defense assistance to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, our three key Baltic allies. Securing an authorization for the Baltic Security Initiative last year was one of my proudest moments in Congress, and I'm pleased that $180 million was included in the omnibus spending package. In your written remarks, you also mentioned the Department is dedicating funding to this initiative each year. Would you share your perspective on the Baltic Security Initiative and how you envision it moving forward? Thank you, Congressman. Um, we, the Bal our Baltic allies were among the first and clearest in understanding the challenge that Russia poses not only to their security but to European security. And they have led, I think it's fair to say, a lot of the thinking in NATO about the requirements for effective deterrence. Um, and the early uh, iterations of the European Reassurance Initiative and all, all that you mentioned uh, have focused on creating that rotational presence that General Walters referred to in his opening remarks um, and in making, and making sure that uh, those forward presidents include uh, not just forces, but the enablers required to make that deterrence effective. And the Baltic countries have done a great job of cooperating with one another uh, through the Baltic Security Initiative in order to uh, make that credibility coherent and sort of greater than the sum of its parts. Um, they are interested in sustaining um, multi-allied multi contributions. Um, and I think that the American ability to elevate the importance of NATO allies continuing to support on a multinational basis is something that signals to those countries and their, and their citizens uh, that this is an all of alliance um, effort. Great. It, it, thank you. Uh, are there any particular areas where you would like to see the United States deepen cooperation with Baltic states? And do you think there's more that we can and should be doing to support our Baltic allies? Well, I'll mention, uh, 
the focus on uh, sharing and helping build resilience in cybersecurity, which again, they were leading voices on the importance of having experienced themselves, uh, but they are frontline. Uh, the Russian government does, and hackers do target Russian-speaking populations in those countries. So I think hi highlighting uh, the importance of cyber resilience uh, and their best practices in helping the rest of us learn would be something we, we need to focus on in the next stages as well. Thank you. Uh, General Walters, I want to ask you about the threat that Russia poses in the gray zone. As I've said before, if we draw any lessons from the ongoing war in Ukraine, it is that we need to ensure allies and partners are too prickly for any adversary or competitor to swallow. That's why irregular warfare training is so, is so crucial. Recognizing that we are in this unclassified setting, what insights can you share about how UCOM is, is approaching this challenge? Are there additional steps we should be taking to bolster irregular warfare capabilities throughout UCOM? Congressman, you should exercise, train, and act in competition as, as closely mirrored to how you anticipate acting in crisis and conflict. And many of our operations, activities, and investments over the course of the last several years that you're very familiar with in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania ha have focused on that very issue. And in, in so doing, taking into account all domains, you, you'll, approve, you'll improve your ability uh, to, to, to gain in the deterrence arena with respect to activities in the competition phase. And then if the, flip, if the switch is flipped and we wind up in conflict or crisis, you're in a position to where the muscle memory is correct mm -hmm. and, and you perform better. And, and that's exactly where we've been since 2016 as we kicked off the EFP battle groups in the Baltics and each one of those op centers that support those battalion-sized battle groups over time has grown more aware of activities in the gray zone and have become more effective in what we can do with respect to all domain deterrence. In general, and that's, it's not just limited to the Baltic regions. I, I, I think we've seen that regular warfare is uh, both can serve as a deterrent, but also obviously as a you know defense, a defensive, uh, be a great defensive capability for for all of our uh, partners uh, in Europe. Uh, so just want to kind of emphasize that. Last question: There was uh, Dr. Wallander. You said that switchblades were approved. Have they been sent to uh, Ukraine? Uh, those are in the package that is in process of being delivered. Uh, and so in the process of being delivered, as in the actual package being delivered, not as in like the theoretical wording of the package. Yeah, and we can't get into operational details in this session, but we can talk in greater okay. detail in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gallagher is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, General Walters, Commandant Berger has written about future Marine expeditionary advanced bases operating potentially in UCOM that could provide ground and aerial sensing, EW, cyber effects, long-range fires to counter Russia. How would Marines with those capabilities affect your options as a combatant commander? They dramatically enhance our options, Congressman. And as you know, we have exercised cold response ongoing as we speak, and the Commandant just paid a good visit. And what we're seeing out of 2 meth and what we're seeing out of the, out of the mall is, is doing exactly just what you alluded to. A, a brown water force that can shoot, move, and communicate and, and is very, very expeditionary is, is priceless. Uh, for 21st century security. So is this um, some of the stuff we've heard about, 2nd uh, Marine Division potentially working in cooperation with the 6th Fleet to do ASW operations, uh, sensing operations? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? All of that is ongoing in all domains, and the guidance as we embrace cold response, it's an exercise that's proceeding as we speak, is, is to get all of us to, to, to stretch our left and right buoys and, and, and you can't succeed if you just occupy one domain and attempt to achieve effects in one domain. So the Marines are doing a fantastic job of leading from the front and showing the rest of us how to do it right, especially in the brown water environment. So you as a combatant commander see a lot of promise in these experimental efforts. Absolutely. Uh, on a similar note, as the size of our amphibious fleet has diminished over the years, uh, UCOM no longer receives a MU 365 days a year for a 24 seven active crisis response. If the inventory supported it, would you benefit from having a MU that was enabled by both tactical aviation and Group 5 UAS that's capable of reconnaissance and counter-reconnaissance and would be on station 365 days a year? I would, Congressman, but as you well know, as a commander, you, you never get everything that you want. But, but certainly those capabilities are precious 
uh, for effective deterrence. Thank you. Um, on a different note, in the months leading up to February 24th, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, did you consider it part of your mission to deter a Russian invasion of Ukraine? Yes. And what were you doing in order to deter the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Improving our NATO security disposition in all regions and in all domains, not just isolated uh, on the periphery and inside of Ukraine. So you as a combatant commander felt you were part of a interagency effort intended to deter Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine? That's correct. Deter and dissuade. Deter and dissuade. And then on February 24th, Vladimir Putin, of course, invaded Ukraine. Correct? Correct. Now, you could argue he invaded Crimea in 2014. He had, you know, infiltrated the Donbass before that. But nonetheless, in light of that fact, which is indeed a fact, would it be fair to say that deterrence failed in Ukraine? Uh, number one, I would say that NATO solidarity remained, and, and NATO's so ability to effectively question. deter remained, and, and, and I, I can't argue with your conclusion. So deterrence failed to, uh, in Ukraine, uh, specifically integrated deterrence failed in Ukraine. And I don't bring that up to score a, a partisan point. I just think it's worth understanding why that happened particularly as we now have anonymous senior Pentagon officials bragging to the Washington Post about the success of integrated deterrence in Ukraine. Now, it may be true that right now NATO is as unified as it's been in decades. I celebrate that fact. And the fact that Russia, uh, Russia has not expanded its war into NATO territory is a good thing but it is also a low bar for geopolitical success. And the fact remains, as you have just confirmed, that we attempted to deter an invasion of Ukraine, largely using non-military instruments of national power, and that attempt failed. Now, it may be true that nothing could have deterred Putin from doing this. We'll never know. That's a counterfactual. But integrated deterrence as conceptualized by the Pentagon and as implemented in the specific case of Ukraine as a matter of fact failed. And I yield my second. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carbajal is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I too wanted to extend my um, thanks to Paul for his many years of service. Uh, I've gotten to know him over the years and he's just a, a, a quality uh, professional individual, and I just uh, hate to see him go, but congratulate him on his next uh, phase in his life. The war in Ukraine is reshaping the future of U.S.-Russia relations. I am very supportive of the steps the United States and the international community have taken to hold Putin Russia is accountable and isolate him and his oligarchs from the global economy. However, one of the areas of mutual interest had been the extension of the New START Treaty to 2026. We must not forget about the potential for arms control agreements to lessen the threat of nuclear conflict. Dr. Wallander, how will the ongoing crisis impact future arms control opportunities with Russia and perhaps even one step further, China? Um, Congressman, thank you for highlighting the importance of arms control as an instrument of security policy. Um, arms control can serve national security policy by uh, enforcing and reinforcing constraints and restraints, and especially uh, restraints on dangerous weapons, especially in the nuclear enterprise. Uh, Russia has shown no indications that it doesn't value that treaty and continue to comply with it. And the United States will continue to focus on making sure that Russia complies and we continue to have the arms control dialogue with Russia on that treaty. Um, I can't really speak to Chinese strategic uh, thinking on this, but I think that the um, message to China is not only that the U.S. values arms control and lives by it, but when Russia has violated arms control treaties, the United States has called it out. So the importance of compliance, I think, is a clear message both to Russia and to China. Thank you. The department made it clear 
It did not support Poland's proposal to transfer MiG-29s to the Ukraine military due to existing effectiveness of anti-tank anti -tank we weapons and air defense systems. In addition to the concern, Russia could mistake this transfer as escalatory. Countering Russia's air capabilities is critical for not only military operations, but to protect civilians. I am the first to say that we, do, we must do everything to, in our power to not escalate the situation, which is why I have expressed my concern with calls for establishing a NATO enforced no-fly zone over Ukraine. However, the MiG-29, if the MiG-29 proposed transfer was deemed unacceptable due to the risk, and we sadly continue to, to see civilians being targeted, a question for both witnesses, what can the international community do to bolster Ukrainian capabilities to counter Russia's air power and protect civilians? So the air defense and anti-air capabilities that Ukraine possesses has been deploying to good effect and which has been a major focus of U.S. and other country provisions of security assistance has enabled the Ukrainian forces to prevent Russia from achieving air superiority, from uh, holding back uh, Russian air operations, which not only protects Ukrainian uh, military formations, but as you note, helps to prevent attacks on civilians. It doesn't prevent all of them. General Walters can speak to that in more detail, but it has played a role. Thank you. General Walters. Uh, Congressman, just as you said, uh, we, we have to continue to iterate as the campaign progresses and, and make sure that process-wise for supply and demand to the Ukrainian armed forces, they, they get what they need for campaign effectiveness. And, and what they may need tomorrow is different than what it was last week. And if we're not prepared to adjust and iterate to support that, uh, we, we won't be as effective as we can be to help save lives on, on Ukrainian territory. Uh, and, and that's a process that we're continuing to work on, and, and we have to make sure that we maintain a strong dialogue, but we also bear the responsibility to guard against the strategic miscalculation that you alluded to. So we, we can't rest for one second. We've got a lot of work to do out in front of us to make sure that the Ukrainian armed forces are getting the, the right gear at the right time based off where they are in the campaign. Thank you. I'm out of time. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gates is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Wallander, we're not sending the 82nd Airborne into Ukraine, right? Correct. And regime change in Russia is not the policy of the United States, is it? Correct. And God forbid, if the Russians use chemical weapons, we would not respond by using chemical weapons against the Russian people, right? Correct. So why does the president keep speaking out against U.S. policy? Congressman, um, the president uh, has made clear that he um, has not changed U.S. policy on regime change. No, no, I, but why does he speak against it? That he um, is appalled by the horrors, as I think we all are, we're all of appalled. what we're, we're Russia is wreaking in Ukraine. But how could it not confuse our allies and our fellow Americans to have the president saying, the exact opposite of what you just correctly defined as U.S. policy. My understanding from allies is that they value U.S. leadership. They are confident in American commitment to the NATO alliance, and particular uh, the president's words that the United States will deter Russian attack against NATO and defend every inch of NATO territory. That's all fascinating, but it, it, it doesn't get to the question of speaking directly against our policies. Does the Department of Defense assess that the president is likely going forward to speak against U.S. policy on other matters? Congressman, I can't speak to that. Uh, I don't believe that there is any such assessment. Maybe should, I mean, do we have a plan in place for the next moment, right? I mean, because this didn't happen once, it didn't happen twice, it happened three times on like highly consequential stuff like regime change and chemical weapons and sending our service members into Ukraine. And so it, it, I sort of wonder whether or not we have to have contingency plans for, for a president who seems to be a little confused on those matters. And you're saying there is no such contingency plan? I'm telling you, Congressman, that um, the Department of Defense leadership uh, is focused on sustaining and advancing American national security policy of this administration. Is the Department of Defense leadership frustrated by the president's statements against U.S. policy? 
Congressman, I think that is an inappropriate characterization of the Department's commitment. It's not a characterization, it's a question. I said, is the Department leadership frustrated? It's, I'm not characterizing. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to ascertain how hard this job must be to get our force posture aligned, to get our information operations that Mr. Giramendi asked about in line, when you've got a president who seems to be misaligned on these key questions. Congressman, I can only speak for myself. I think it's appropriate, and it's a, you have the Were right to frustrated? ask the question. And so speaking for myself. I'm sorry, mm, but you can't I am, the witness. If you ask a question, you've got to give her at least five seconds to say something before sure. you then interrupt. I Please go ahead. I am not frustrated. I feel privileged and honored to serve the American people and to serve um, this president and this administration. Are, are you aware of any other officials at the department that are frustrated by the president's misstatements of policy? I am not. General Waller, uh, hypersonic weapon systems have been used for the first time in this conflict, and the committee has received a number of briefings regarding how far behind our country is in some of these capabilities. How should uh, UCOM think about hypersonics uh, from a, r really from a defensive capability, uh, seeing what we've seen on the battlefield? Congressman, that's a great question, and it's all about strategic speed and posture. And, and, and every day I've got to find a way to adjust our indications and warnings and adjust our command and control and feedback to accommodate not just a, a Mach 1 target, uh, but a target that can operate at Mach 4.5. And, and if we're not doing this in 2022, we're getting way behind. So the, the efforts are there. Uh, we, we find out what the capabilities are. We find out what their locations are. We, we examine the different courses of action of where these systems can be utilized. And, and now we have to adjust fire with our IW systems and our ISR to, to make sure that we have the best probability of capturing a potential strike. And if we're not adjusting every second of the day, we're making a mistake. And it's, it's a constant adjustment in UCOM as well as SACIR. Speaking of those adjustments, because I only have a moment left, um, Will we see an adjustment in the president's proposed budget or uh, to accommodate our updated thinking about hypersonics now that we've seen them used in Europe? Congressman, we will. Uh, very helpful. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Keating is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad my colleagues acknowledging who the president of the United States actually is. Uh, I met yesterday uh, with uh, several members of the of Ukraine's uh, parliament uh, who also uh, emphasize the fact that they're mothers as well. Uh, and these courageous women uh, were telling a story uh, that uh, the soldiers, the Russian soldiers that have either been captured or killed had uh, protective devices and equipment on them uh, to counter uh, chemical warfare or biological weapons as well. And they were concerned, given the fact that uh, also Putin has lied about Ukraine's uh, having access to biological or chemical weapons, uh, and that could be used as a false flag as well for their use. Uh, can you comment in, in this setting to the best of your ability uh, just to address that issue that they brought up to me? Uh, Congressman, we similarly have uh, noted the efforts on the part of Russian disinformation operations, as classic, to lay the pretext for a potential false flag about chemical the lies about Ukraine having biological weapons and chemical weapons. So we've been tracking it closely um, and share your concern. It would be beyond outrageous for Russia to step over that bound. Um, and it, we share your concern and focus on that issue. General Walters, I, I don't know, they didn't describe what particular equipment they had, uh, but do you think that uh, their concern is justified? Uh, Congressman, I, I think the, the, the fix in this area is get the truth out at speed so that you can make a difference. And, and we are dramatically improving our ability to sense what is said and to respond quickest and in the information domain to arrest the false flags that occur. That, that's the change that we need to make, and we are making. And I, I, I see a higher degree of effectiveness in this campaign than I've witnessed before, and it's just because we've drawn on some pretty severe lessons learned from, from previous engagements. Yeah, I have a concern, too, that um, we talked about strategic miscalculation, but I'm also concerned uh, with public reports uh, about the level of communication between the Russians and our own uh, chair, of the Joint Chiefs. Th these things are in place, even in the worst times of war, for deconfliction uh, and similar kind of uh, miscalculations or 
that, that it can occur. Uh, does that seem to be a concern? Is there anything, is it true to the extent you can talk to, uh, to the, in the setting uh, about the deteriorating level of communication at the highest level of the military, which is uh, always there as a safeguard? Congressman, I can comment about the the SACI responsibilities that I have to communicate with my counterpart in Russia for the purpose of safety deconfliction. Uh, the, the attempts have been made constantly over the course of the last 90 days. At, at some point, as we approach closer to the campaign that they initiated without us knowing, those conversations broke off. And I won't speak for the chairman, but I, I know he's done the same, and he's been very, very aggressive with respect to seeking that conversation with his counterpart for the purpose of safety deconfliction. And unfortunately, those conversations haven't occurred. That's distressing. Uh, Dr. Wallander, uh, on sanctions, you know, we talked a lot about sanctions uh, in this war uh, and their effectiveness uh, with the Ukraine, uh, you know, withstanding so much themselves on the ground, nothing <coughs> compares to what they're doing. But uh, these sanctions uh, we're all giving, the, our European allies are, are, you know, taking some of the pain, we are as well. But the sanctions are, doing more than just affecting the economy. Uh, I think they have a strategic effect on Russia's military capability as well, things like semiconductors, chips, and everything. Can you talk to the effectiveness of some of the sanctions on uh, what they're doing to Russia's military capability? So, Congressman, you rightly point to not just the financial sanctions, but the restrictions on technology. Um, the, that Those restrictions will have an effect over time. And um, my understanding from the sanctions package that was chosen is that it was designed both to have the effect over time and to target precisely Russia's future capabilities um, so that its ability to launch these kinds of military operations against its neighbors uh, is severely impacted. Well, well, thank you both for your service. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul for his service, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bacon is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for you both being here. Uh, appreciate your leadership. And I was with uh, General Walter, some of his recently retired peers last night, and they were pr singing your praises. So thank you for what you're doing in, in NATO. Um, my, my main feedback to the administration since like d December, January, and February is that we were being told, yes, uh, Russia has decided to attack. And a lot of the emphasis is what we're going to do after the invasion. I always felt like we should have been putting more emphasis on the deterrence side of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I recommended long-range air defenses. I rec recommended anti-shipping missiles. But I was told that that would be provocative. And I think that put us behind the eight ball once the invasion occurred. And now the, the Ukrainians are asking for MiG-21s, uh, Su-25s, and we're, t we're resisting that. And we're saying that we need to do long-range air defenses instead. Now, I do agree the long-range air defenses have been very effective against the Russian Air Force, but it doesn't do much for the convoys, the tanks, and we got to be able to provide the Ukrainians the ability to hit those 5,000 or so armored vehicles. And I, so that get, brings me to my question, the, switch, the switchblade. I think it's a very capable system, but 100 is not enough. Do you, would you agree that if they got thousands of these vehicles, we got to have to rate increase that ability to go after the, these convoys, these tanks, the armored, armored vehicles. So that would be my question to Gerald Walters. Congressman, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, when we get the first set of switchblades in, there'll be an immediate request from the Ukrainians for more. So no argument here. It, it seems imperative that we give them the ability to hit these convoys and trucks 20, 30, 40 miles back. You know, the javelins are more in the close in fight. And I think that they could have a, a tipping point impact. Uh, my next question involves the F-35 to General Walters again. H how important is the F-35 delivery uh, to you and NATO, uh, whether it's U.S. or to allies? It's critical, Congressman, and, and we can talk more in a classified setting, and I know you're familiar with a lot of this, but, mm -hmm. but the, the U.S. F-35As, the four that we have right now are in use, and, and they've been very effective doing some elegant uh, ISR activities. And, and it just reveals to us uh, how much greater capability we're going to have once we get our full fleet on board. And as you well know, the disposition of, of, of the NATO nations with respect to the F-35 is dramatically growing. And our, our hope is we, we have 100, in, 100 on the continent right now, and we anticipate in 2030 uh, growing to 550. And that's a good fleet. Um, 
concerned that the president's budget, uh, for at least the American buy, it's being reduced. And, I th and we're gonna have to figure out how to do nuclear modernization plus provide these kind of capabilities. I know it's hard to, to balance all that, but I think there's a real cost if we do reduce our F-35 buy. Um, my third point is more of a comment. I'm on the Baltic Security <clears throat> Caucus co-chair with my uh, colleague Ruben Gallego, and they do say their number one request is permanent U.S. presence. And I know you've heard that before. I just want to also footstop that. Now, also, there's a request for air defense capabilities to the Baltics and the MLRS, and I just wanted to make that for the record there. Uh, my final question really deals with Russian energy and its impact on our bases in Europe. Uh, Ramstein, Spangdalem, uh, the new hospital, rely on Russian gas. I think that's unacceptable. And how do we build this resilience into the U.S. bases so that we're not dependent on Russian gas? And I, that question to either one of you. Congressman, I'll take a shot at that first. You. It, it, as you will know, um, the Central European pipeline goes to certain nations. Uh, we'll continue to work ways to try to expand that to the max extent practical. And Europe itself gets 40 percent of their natural gas from Russia. Uh, we in DOD, as you also will know, over the course of the last decade and a half, have, have worked on, uh, uh, on stock reserve with respect to petrol and stock reserve with respect to generators and in critical infrastructures like uh, the, the new hospital and the current hospital, those have to be available so that we can appropriately sustain. And that's very expensive and a tough way to do business. But we have to continue to look at ways to take that Central European pipeline and mm -hmm. get it out to as many folks as possible. Yeah, I've been uh, preaching this concern now for about three years because if Russia turns off their energy and Ramstein's so pivotal to what we're doing, it, 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 it doesn't just make sense. So we've got to come up with a better resilience plan. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I thank you both for your leadership. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kem is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, wanted to thank the two of you for coming over here. And I don't want to retread uh, too much of what's been uh, asked and, and what will continue to be asked about Ukraine, but I, I did want to just uh, point out my my uh, strong urgence to the administration to really follow through on the priority lists that the Ukrainians are providing us in terms of what security defenses are there, and for us to take that close look, including on, on the jets, including on the long-range uh, air defense systems and things of that nature. You know, I think at this stage in the conflict, especially when we're seeing this, our own administration highlighting the war crimes that are happening against the Ukrainian people, that we recognize that you know, some of this equipment it's not offensive capabilities if, the, if their country is being invaded. You know, these are defensive capabilities that are trying to address this in that kind of capacity. It's not quite escalatory in that same way if we're thinking about this as that defensive uh, effort. Uh, so I just wanted to say that, but look, I know you're getting lots of questions on that. What I also wanted to just raise is I know that we have had so many conversations lately with our NATO partners about this new era of NATO and what this means going forward, this new posture that we have. I was with uh, many of you at the uh, Munich Security Conference when we were talking about that just before the war started. So as there's this greater solidarity within NATO, uh, I guess I wanted to ask you, and I'll start with Dr. Wallander, when we look at this threat that NATO's facing and the investments and the increased investments that countries are saying that they're willing to make, what is that looking like right now in terms of the conversations? Obviously, there's the security threats that we face with Russia right now, and that's important, and that's something that we need to posture towards. But what we also recognize is that you know, the next great threat to NATO may not necessarily come in the form of tanks rolling across you know, Eastern Europe. You know, we have had a lot of concerns about cyber, about space, about hypersonics. And honestly, in this room, we've talked a lot more about just the, the greater threat when it comes to China and the Chinese government going forward, um, even more so than we have of Russia. So I guess I wanted to ask, when we're having those conversations with our NATO partners about this new mission, this new era of NATO, how is that factoring into the broader effort? Are we making sure that we're looking at this comprehensively across the topography of threats that we face? Um, thank you, Congressman. Yes, and the answer is yes. Um, it, the Russian aggression has galvanized, and, and China's uh, failure to stand on the right side of history in calling Russia out for its aggression, uh, and, and reports that China may be 
entertaining the thought of helping Russia cope with the effects of sanctions and some of the restrictions has really galvanized European uh, leaderships and, and publics to understand that China is a global challenge and threat, not just one in the Asia-Pacific region, and that China, like Russia, in, um, extends its malign influence um, through corruption, through some questionable commercial and economic um, means and through cyber as well. And so working with NATO and the EU, um, it is possible now, I think, to elevate U.S. Uh, European cooperation on the global challenge that China poses. And that those conversations are happening even as we speak. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. And, and in general, I love your thoughts on this as well, because, you know, as we are talking about NATO, obviously, yes, there is a, a, a immediate concern about NATO's role uh, when it comes to this European threat. Um, but what we've also known is that, yes, the transatlantic alliance and the effort there is focused on Europe as well, but there's a global role for NATO as well, and that's certainly something that we have in mind when it comes to uh, even the Indo-Pacific area. So uh, I, I love your thoughts, uh, just kind of building off of Dr. Wallander, um, your conversations with NATO partners and whether or not they understand that gravity of, of not just thinking about this in terms of Russia, but more broadly as well. Uh, NATO is very engaged in that area. The, the Secretary General will host a leaders summit at the end of June in Spain, and, and he will introduce with the leaders the, the NATO 2030 strategy, and it touches on this very issue by making sure that we look inside and outside of our area of responsibility in our European continent to, to, to grasp all, all of the issues that could impact security for Europe, and obviously the focus on China is part of that. And the Secretary has been very, very loud about that. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to report that the, that the NATO 2030 strategy will take that into account. Okay, well, thank you so very much. I think it's just so important that we uh, think about this in that strategic plan, not just about you know, the, the challenge and the threat right at our door, but also thinking about what's down the road, you know, what might be coming next. So thank you for your attention to thank that. You. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Banks is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, in, in layman's terms, can you explain what a escalation avoidance strategy actually means? Do not enter into World War III. What does it mean specifically? I mean, what, what, define it. What, what, how, does it, how does it apply in this case? Every action has a reaction, and if that reaction gets you closer towards sparking and starting World War III, you need to go back and readjust what your activity is. Okay. Um, on March 25th, USNI News reported the pres that the president of Latvia, President Levitz, argued that if NATO had reacted more strongly in 2008 to Russian aggression against neighboring Georgia and the Kremlin's 2014 annexation of Crimea, Moscow wouldn't now have invaded Ukraine. Additionally, he stated that he said that the appeasement tactics, quote, are not fruitful. General has, an, has a a U.S. escalation avoidance strategy with Russia prevented Russian aggression in Ukraine? Ensuring that you have NATO unity has, has ensured greater peace across the European continent. With respect to your question as it, as it applies to Ukraine and Russia, Russia gets a vote on this, and, and Russia is responsible for, for their invasion. Okay. What, General, why did Putin decide to invade Ukraine right now? I think he felt it, like it, he why, had... Why not any time between 2014 and 2022, why didn't he invade, but why did he invade now? I think he felt like he had uh, popular support of the citizens of Russia. I also felt like he was attempting to take advantage of fissures that could have appeared in NATO as a result of the post-Afghanistan environment. And I also think it has to do with his age and his efficacy. And, and all those combined together put him in a position to where he elected to go at this time. But the, the overriding variable, in my view, is the fact that he believes that he has popular support with his citizens. Russia's invasion has heightened concerns about NATO's ability to defend NATO member states, particularly the Baltic states, from a possible Russian military attack. What is your assessment for NATO member states' willingness and capacity to respond to an intentional or inadvertent attack on a NATO member state? We have changed and will continue to change our military posture, not just in Eastern Europe, but, but in all quadrants. And, and that activity, as you're well aware, is ongoing. 
and, and the degree of cooperation from the na nations is, is as strong as we've seen. The Washington Post reported on March 11th that President Zelensky pleaded for the MiG-29 transfer while having support from a bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers, including many, many of us in this room. And the, the Biden administration, citing assessments from senior American military commanders in Europe, has said the additional aircraft would offer only minimal value to Ukraine given the contested nature of its airspace. Do you still agree with that assessment? I do, Congressman. Russia is bombarding Ukrainian civilians. Ukraine obviously needs equipment for air defense. What equipment should the U.S. or NATO provide Ukraine for it to defend itself from Russian aerial attacks? Uh, 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 I'd like to address this more in, in a classified setting, but it goes directly to your point about defining what the problem actually is in the battle space and targeting that problem. Understood. Um, and I look forward to those uh, answers in, in a classified setting. The Trump administration was the first administration to provide Ukraine with javelins and significantly increased lethal aid to the Baltic states. Why is the U.S. or its NATO partners not supplying more anti-aircraft defense systems to Ukraine? Sir, again, in a classified setting, I'll, I can give you the, the contributions per nation in this particular area, and, and I think it might clear the area a little bit about what is actually going to the Ukrainians. General, is NATO too concerned with escalation to more effectively support Ukraine? NATO is very concerned about effectively supporting Ukraine and also very concerned about ensuring that we, we manage escalation appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. We'll now recognize uh, Ms. Slocken from Michigan. Thank you to both of you for being here. I know we're in hour two here, two and a half, um, and I can't think of two better people to come and talk to us about these issues right now, um, both of you. Um, you know, many of us are very affected by this Ukrainian parliamentary um, delegation that's here in town that was sent uh, to kind of advocate. Uh, there, I met with them this morning, and their position is that, in contrast to what the media is reporting about the negotiations between the Ukrainians and the Russians, that the Russians are not at all being benevolent about uh, pulling back from cities, that in fact, anywhere they're announcing they're pulling back are areas where the Ukrainians are kicking them out. Can you speak to that? Is that a correct characterization? Do we see anything that connotes any kind of pullback by the Russians at all in the name of peace? Congresswoman, some, some small maneuvering of, of, of forces, uh, I, I believe, for the purpose of, of adjusting the campaign to go into a different geographical region. And, and as a military commander, as you well know, I, 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 I can't trust anything with respect to a potential foe. So we, we continue to remain vigilant in all areas, and we certainly anticipate that this area uh, will, will be readdressed by the Russians in the near future. Okay. Um, we were also told that a new list of equipment and support requests was transmitted to the Department of State and Department of Defense. Are you too aware of this request? And either way, who in the Department of Defense is the senior most person responsible for metering out the new request from the Ukrainian government? Uh, we have a request from the Ministry of Defense as recently as uh, yesterday. I do not know if it's the same list as the one you were handed. I'm guessing it is. Um, the responsibility for uh, security assistance assessment is managed in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy, including my chain of command, and it is something we work on every day. Is there a unit or a task force or some emergency group that's been stood up at the Pentagon that's specifically looking for the Soviet-era weapons that the Ukrainians have so desperately asked us for? And if so, who is the head of that unit? That would be my, led by my office in cooperation with other components of DOD, including DSCA, Joint Staff, uh, Intelligence Community, and Diplomatic Outreach. So there is, a, there is a task force or something that's set up, or it's housed in your, in your office? It's housed in our office. Okay. Um, um, can you just give us the official position? You've heard a bunch of us ask about the equipment of the planes, the Soviet-era planes. What is the official position of the Department of Defense on providing or helping to facilitate NATO, uh, excuse me, Russian-made aircraft that the Ukrainians have asked for? The official policy is that uh, countries that wish to donate, th that have those so Soviet legacy aircraft, it's their sovereign decision. Um, we ask those countries, if they're NATO allies, to consider 
the potential escalation dynamics and that balancing of risk that General Walters has explained so well. Um, and we are listening to the Ukrainians carefully on what they need and working to fulfill their requests um, as as diligently as we are able. Okay, just a couple of additional questions. Um, Dr. Wallander, you've talked about uh, watching the China-Russia relationship, and obviously I think for, for a lot of us here, it's very interesting um, to, to think about what China is learning from all of this. Um, we know that there's been some military cooperation exercises, those kinds of things. We know there's been talks between the Russians and the Chinese. Have you seen any evidence, classified or otherwise, just yes or no, that the Chinese are working with the Russians on non-conventional military means, so cyber attack in particular? No. Okay. Have you seen any other evidence that the Chinese are um, uh, aiding and, uh, and abetting the Russians other than um, sort of the, the kind of conversations that they've been having and sort of the basic supplies that they've been providing, things like MREs? No. Okay. And then lastly, I would just say, you know, I think um, there's a lot of interest in sort of the future of NATO with Finland and Sweden making noises about being interested with other countries like North Macedonia um, trying to get in. Um, just very briefly, is there any plan to change the criteria to think differently about how fast NATO membership goes, knowing that it's typically a very slow process? I'm not aware of any uh, assessment to change the timeline. The criteria remain the same, and the membership is driven by the desire and the request of potential new allies. Appreciate it. I think North Macedonia is the one that we hope will be broken in soon, sooner rather than later for a whole bunch of reasons. But thanks very much for your time. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Waltz is recognized for five Thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to build on the comments of some of my colleagues. Um, and I think we need to recognize and we need to do so in a very clear-eyed way that deterrence did fail. Um, the fact that we have cities that are now leveled, it's notable that NATO is now unified, it's notable that Germany is reversing its long-held positions, whether it's on energy or on, on its defense spending, but we have four million refugees in cities that are leveled because deterrence failed. So just to be clear, General Walters, you agreed deterrence failed? Reference the parameters that you just talked about, no argument. I mean, saying that our Asian allies are, are unified after Taipei is leveled, right? Uh, we, we, we need to apply these lessons and these failures uh, and, and lessons learned on, on what failed up front. And I think on top of the lack of response 2018, lack of response in 2014, we now had New START, which is the Russians' top priority, extended cleanly with really nothing uh, uh, in return. Lack of response to the colonial pipeline, uh, the lifting of, of, of sanctions on Nord Stream 2, not to mention the Germans and others' posture beforehand. Uh, and I think part of that, when I was out on a visit, was the continual message that we heard out in Kyiv was that the weapons that the Ukrainians were asking for as recently as December would have been too escalatory, um, including the stingers. General, would it have made a difference if the Ukrainians had had stingers months ago, had the opportunity to train on them, and had them on day one? Would that have made an operational difference in their ability to fight? Congressman, it could have. And, and as we talked about before in our discussions yesterday, as we always do in the military, which you're very familiar with, we've got to go back and scrub this from cradle to grave and make sure in every potential soft spot uh, we look where, where, where some of the flaws are and make corrections, and that may very well be one of the areas. I don't know. I mean, in fact, we were told that we couldn't, the United States couldn't give, this committee was told that we couldn't give them stingers because we didn't have any export variants, only to find out eight weeks later it was literally three screws and a component that had to be taken off. And I think we owe that uh, to the Ukrainians, and we owe that honest assessment to ourselves. In the same vein, we talked about how sanctions are biting on the R Russian logistics system. Would it have been effective if we had had those sanctions six months ago in place and more effective now? It could have been, and we need to scrub that as well. Okay. Um, just switching to the, to the Black Sea, which we talked about as well. Do we currently have any U.S. ships in the Black Sea? We do not. When, were, when did those, uh, I believe it was two DDGs, when did they move out? 
It was in the January time frame. Pre-invasion. Pre-invasion. That was a policy decision to vacate the Black Sea. It was. Dr. Wallander, what was the policy decision to essentially cede an ocean, or cede the Black Sea, excuse me, to the Russian Navy? Congressman, I was not in office at the time, but I owe you an answer, and I will get back to you with an answer of the assessment. Okay, but at your assessment now, we we're not putting any force structure in now to, I mean, literally, as Russian ships are bombarding Mariupol, and by the way, we didn't give harpoons because those could have been too escalatory, so let's speak to the now, and, but I would appreciate an answer. I mean, that what I understood as the policy decision was that ships in the Black Sea would be too escalatory. Uh, and, and we didn't want to provoke uh, the Russians. I think we're seeing a theme here that we need to be very, very careful of as we move forward, and that a fear of escalation could actually invite uh, the escalation from the other side. But the, in terms of the ships now, and are, General, are we flying over the Black Sea now with any military assets? We are, Congressman. Directly over? Or not on the periphery, but actually... We, we are overflying the Black Sea with, with unmanned aerial systems and in the southern portion with, with manned systems and commercial. Great. Last question. In terms of training the Ukrainians outside of Ukraine, are we conducting any training of the Ukrainians outside of Ukraine? We, we are not, Congressman. That There is uh, some advising taking place with liaison officers right. to ensure that we can get why, the appropriate Dr. Wallander, as a policy matter, why are we not training them? I am not aware of any requests from the Ukrainians to train outside. Uh, so I'm Ukrainians don't want to be trained on the weapon systems that we're providing them? I believe the Ukrainians are fighting in the country at this time. I am not aware of any requests, but I owe you a good answer on whether we have received such requests. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I will let people know we're breaking at 12.30, so if we don't get to your questions in the public se session, we are having a classified session at 1 o'clock. We'll prioritize people who were not able to ask a question here in, in the classified um, section. But at 12.30, we turn into a pumpkin. We give these folks a break before we then do the classified session at 1. So we'll get to as many as we can before then. With that, Ms. Cheryl is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I echo many of the Chairman's comments on Paul Archangeli. I'm sorry to see him go. Um, General Walters, with the establishment of a theater fires command in Europe, will the Army look to deploy more ground-based surface-to-surface indirect fire assets, such as the IRCA, to the European theater, especially given that currently uh, Russian artillery outranges ours? Congresswoman, that's a possibility, and I, I hearken back to post-conflict with what has taken place right now. Af after we have a deep scrub with respect to an after-action review, th this will be one of the areas that we, we address. But the, the, the theater fires construct is exactly what we need, and we're excited about going forward with that. So in that vein, will these systems, do you expect they'll meet the needs of uh, these type of systems meet the needs of the Theater Fires Command, or are you going to look towards more ground-based extended-range hypersonic projectiles such as the SLURC? We'll, we'll look at as many domains as we possibly can to, to use those capabilities, and again, we'll, we, we'll be able to fine-tune uh, our focus once we, once we have a post-conflict scrub on this particular area. But, but again, uh, as many domains as possible is better uh, when it comes to deterrence and defense. And can you speak a little bit more about that, about the importance of having an all-weather, surface-to-surface, precision fires capability in UCOM? Congressman, I'll just state that uh, having those capabilities that, that impact as many domains as possible that have the ability to range with precision complicates the task for a potential enemy against us, so it dramatically improves your deterrence posture, and, and that's all positive. Thank you. And further, regarding the ongoing war in Ukraine, we've seen multiple reports regarding the Russian military's logistical challenges uh, with stopped convoys, abandoned vehicles, and stranded forces, all leading to a loss of combat power that's proving deadly to Russian forces on the ground. Um, although UCOM's taking steps to guarantee infrastructure that would allow for freedom of maneuver throughout the AOR, what steps are we taking to ensure, ensure logistical efforts will be successful in a contested environment, particularly with fuels and or power sources? Are we looking at 
new fuels or power sources for, um, to make sure that we maintain our logistics in theater? Uh, we are, Congresswoman, and it, it first starts with uh, the, the independence that we must possess for the basics. That's electricity and gas, and it goes back to some of the previous discussions that we've had. As you know, we, we stock additional gas and we stock additional generators for the purpose of having ex expeditionary services to go to in the event that certain systems are shut down. And, and, and we need to continue to advance that independence with with, with all the areas that you alluded to, and, and that is actually part of future plans. Thank you. And then, you know, with respect to our preparation um, and supporting the Ukrainians, under the previous administration, we know um, President Trump withheld javelins, um, contrary to the, the expectations of this committee. Are the javelins proving to be important in the fight now against the Russians for the Ukrainians? Yes, Congresswoman. Thank you. And as we're looking towards how we are going to move forward united with our NATO and UCOM partners, um, Dr. Wallander, have you seen this administration working incredibly hard in close support with our NATO allies? Yes, Congresswoman. And has that been an important part of our fight against uh, the, to make sure that we are isolating the Russians from the world community? It's been vital to isolating Russia, helping Ukraine, and sending a credible message to Russia. And as we're looking to support um, the Ukrainians, uh, have we done so in, uh, with our, our NATO allies, and have we gotten the Ukrainians um, much of what they need to be as successful as they have been currently in this fight against Russia? We have been coordinating and communicating with NATO allies with their willingness, and we've been communicating many of the requirements that the Ukrainians convey to us so that allies that have those capabilities and are willing to provide them are able to do so. Well, thank you very much. I was in Ukraine uh, meeting with President Zelensky shortly before the Russian invasion, and uh, much of what he asked for, the stingers, the javelins, and the support for ammo on the ground. I see that we have provided him, and it seems as if it's been very successful for the Ukrainian people in their fight against Russia, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Franklin is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Walters, to follow up on uh, Representative Waltz's questions, uh, I'm still a little confused about the messaging on what we're doing in Poland. A week ago, the National Security Advisor said we were doing no training. Then President Biden said we were. And then yesterday, a senior administration official said that U.S. troops help Ukrainian forces in Poland load weapons the West gives them. As they do so, they provide verbal instruction on how to use the weaponry like anti-aircraft missiles, but don't, don't lead Ukrainian forces through physical drills. Very mixed messaging. It's confusing to, to all of us. Uh, did, did anyone in the White House coordinate any of those statements with you as the, as the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe? No, Congressman. Uh, not asking you to elaborate in this setting specifically what we may or may not be doing with Ukrainian soldiers. I'll defer that to a, a classified session. What is your military advice on publicly talking specifically about how we train the Ukrainians? Can you, can you quantify that? I'm, I'm having a hard time grasping what the question is. Well, I'm, I'm, should we be talking publicly about what we're doing specifically on the ground tactically with, with our allies? Uh, not publicly, Congressman. Thanks. So, General, uh, I think we've witnessed a change in defensive tactics uh, during this invasion of Ukraine that, that few really expected. Uh, we've all seen decimated Russian armor columns and the takedown of relatively sophisticated fighters by cheap and plentiful weapons. I know there'll be a lot for tacticians to chew on in our war colleges when the war ends, but it already looks clear that the 20th century tactics of mass land warfare aren't as effective today as they were when Eastern Europe was last invaded during World War II. Do you think the Ukrainian strategy of low cost, high volume kinetic weapons is a feasible strategy for future conflicts against competitor nations? Congressman, I'm not familiar with all the parameters of the so-called Ukrainian strategy, uh, but, but, but I will tell you that uh, one of the things that makes a huge difference is is what, what's in the heart of the citizens and their support for the military activities. And I think a after this is all said and done, when we go back and take a look at what transpired, uh, th that is one of the areas that, that has made a big difference, certainly up to this point, and, and we still have a long ways to go. 
Well, clearly, and we've all been just amazed at the, the tenacity of the Ukrainian fighters, and I think there's a lot to be said for the training that we've conducted uh, side by side with those allies, uh, not just the Ukrainians, and, and, and also uh, the high impact of, of relatively low cost things like uh, drones, stingers, javelins, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many tanks you have if they can be taken out pretty simply with low tech weapons. Do you think the calculus of investing in high value, high tech, long build time systems uh, will or, or should shift in the DOD to favor more nimble and expendable systems? Congressman, I think that's going to be one of the areas that we have to take a deep look at. And, and that mixed with uh, capabilities that are less elegant need to be factored into this discussion. And, and we have to be willing to, to listen very closely about what we've learned and then we'll make adjustments. Roger that. Uh, finally, last question. Do you see the possibility of amending our current offensive and defensive strategies with the lessons we've lear we're learning in Ukraine? And, and if so, uh, what might those look like? And I know it's early uh, to be making those kinds of assessments. I think we have to always be willing to adapt to change and, and listen to every possible input in, in every part of, of any conflict. And, and this is one of the areas that no matter how insignificant we think some issue may be, we've got to pay attention to it. And I, I think if we're a good learning organization, which the department certainly is, uh, we'll, we'll take all that into account as we press forward. But yes, uh, we, we have to learn from what unfolded in this particular conflict. We still have a long ways to go, though. Roger that. Thank you, General. Now you're back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Crow is recognized when he's done. We're going to take our break at 1230. We'll reconvene at 1 o'clock upstairs for the classified portion of the hearing. Uh, Mr. Crow is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both of you for coming in today. I wanted to start by uh, just uh, addressing a comment that one of my colleagues made earlier about concerns about intelligence failures. Uh, and, and General Walters, you had said that you, you guys would conduct an assessment of where you are soft in areas where you can improve, which I appreciate. But you know, I sit on both the Armed Services and the Intel Committee, and I have to say, we nailed it. Like, so we're starting back last fall, we started to determine what was happening. We were ringing the alarm bells, and we engaged in an unprecedented uh, public engagement and private engagement with our allies, with the international community, uh, releasing, declassifying information. Uh, getting the Ukrainians prepared to address this. You know, this, this is, in my view, uh, one of our generation's uh, uh, finest intelligence successes uh, and something that I think we should talk more about. And I just wanted to, to say that, and, and I hope you, know, you all agree, uh, because, yes, we can always improve, and that's the military mindset, General Walters, which I appreciate. There's always room for improvement. That's why we do AARs. Uh, but I think it's important to say that uh, the intelligence community and, and the military did an exceptional job, and I, and I want to point that out. Um, so starting with uh, uh, Dr. Wallander, uh, I've been in regular communication with Ukrainian uh, military and civilian leadership, and they have provided me with um, a document that's entitled The Urgent Needs of the Armed Forces of Ukraine in a Priority Order. And it lists 17 items, and it goes into extreme detail. I wanted to ask both of you, have you received, and are you familiar with this list? Yes. And uh, General Walters? Yes. And is the Department of Defense uh, looking at this list uh, in a detailed way and going down these requests? Yes. And is the Department of Defense uh, prepared to either in a classified or non-classified setting or, or uh, on the record provide this committee uh, with uh, an, an analysis of all these requests and either what we're able to comply with or what we're not and if we're not, or the reasons why we're not? Yes. Okay, thank you. And then uh, uh, kind of broadening out in terms of our security cooperation, a couple of weeks ago there was this issue of the providing of MiGs uh, through Poland uh, that occurred and the administration came out and I think General Walters, you, you made it clear that you thought that um, providing fighter jets uh, would not be appropriate uh, at this time. Uh, and yet we continue to hear from Ukraine this would, this would be not you know, a, a game changer necessarily, but an important element to Ukraine Ukraine's defense, that it would allow them to project power, particularly in the south and the east, to Mariupol and other places where they cannot, uh, allow them to cut off supply lines. So I'm trying to, uh, and they also have told me that uh, they're rebuilding their airfields, they have airfield capability, they have logistics support capability, they have uh, pilots that are able to fly it and they can support it, and that it would make a difference. And it strikes me that um, Ukrainians are not going to ask necessarily for something that they can't use in most instances because they're fighting for their survival. So. Could you both tell me um, where are we on the fighter jet issue 
Is that something that we are taking a fresh look at, uh, number one? And number two, this issue of escalation. Um, does the administration draw a line at, at vehicles, at, at aircraft and vehicles? Is that determined to be too escalatory and we're only going to provide things short of that? Dr. Wallander, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I don't believe that the position of the Department of Defense, both the policy side and the military ad best advice has changed on the assessment, although I defer to General Walters. Um, on, the, on the fighter jets? On the general issue that you raised about, have we changed our position on that? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, on the issue of ruling out certain kinds of vehicles, I think it is uh, capabilities uh, driven rather than particular kinds of vehicles, but we can pursue this and get into more detail in the next session. And Congressman, I'll just add, uh, uh, good departments uh, allow commanders to provide best military advice. I, I continue to assess, and, and I, I do know with Secretary Austin, he, he expects me, if, if I deem so, to, to provide best military advice to change courses. And at this time, uh, that is not my best military advice with respect to the aircraft. And I can elaborate on that a little bit more in a uh, classified setting. So just to, before we go into classified setting, though, so and understand, so it's your best military advice that the United States or its allies should not provide fighter jets to Ukraine at this time. Is that accurate? It is my best military advice that the U.S. doesn't, and it's also my best military advice that we allow nations to independently make their decision about what they would like to offer the Ukrainians. I, I don't want to thwart any of that. Okay, well, we'll we're out of time, and we'll follow up on, uh, in, in a classified setting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Very thorough. Uh, we will continue in a half hour in 2212 with our classified portion.